I'm sort of paranoid. There's an army of slugs trying to take over the world, and my brother's one of them. A controller. You ever hear the saying that human beings are reluctant to change? I guess they've never met any of my friends before. If you want to save the world, you have to change. When it comes to the Yurks, all we know is that they're trying to destroy us. Everyone we know on our planet. But we're a threat to them. Five teenagers. I know my friends and I can save Tom. I'm going to use Elfango's gift. The power to morph. I realize what's at stake here. It's the total ruin of our planet by the Yerks. And it's scary. Every time I do something, I get a little stronger and I get smarter. I'm scared too. But fear doesn't stop me. Because I'm more afraid of what will happen if I don't do anything. And when I morphed into the tiger, you know, I wasn't afraid for a second. No Yerk was going to stand in my way. Feeling like the tiger has changed me. You know, made me confident and stronger. I'm not as afraid anymore. Welcome to Thought Speak, a podcast dedicated to the weekly discussion of K. Applicate's 1996 book series, Animorphs. My name is Coleman. And my name is Mitchell. And we're going to jump right into news. I think this is news that people have been waiting on for a while and they didn't know it. It was just deep deep in their hearts it's it's uh, truly one of the uh greatest days to be an animorphs fan especially for someone like me who has uh had to find other ways to secure these items in well the past. yeah if, if if any of our listeners haven't heard the big news yet we posted it on the facebook page by the way uh animorphs is now on netflix as of yesterday july 1st yes netflix has graciously taken uh the TV show into their bosom, and we couldn't <laughs> their be happier. loving, kind bosom. <laughs> and I think uh, I think we're going to see a lot of new Animorphs fans. Well, fans is a rough word uh, when the oh. TV show might be your first experience. With I, Animorphs. Yeah, that's that's what I kind of actually dread is that that will be a lot of people's first exposure to the Animorphs brand, and they're not going to be very impressed. <laughs> I think that's definitely going to happen because. You look at um, Sean Ashmore on that front cover of the Netflix app, and uh, you just watched, maybe you just walked out of X-Men Days of Future Past a couple <laughs> weeks ago, and you're like, oh man, I know that guy. What's well, what's this show all about? Let's see. Oh, oh no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, you're going to walk away disappointed. Now, I don't remember any episode other than the pilot, and um, so I, I just kind of casually watched an episode i think it was like four or six maybe it was the uh, adaptation they did of the message uh book four right where they find axe yes and i they they just they dragged it through the dirt and they <laughs> stomped on its corpse and it was not a good not a good adaptation yeah, I mean, well, a first off, they nix the entire ocean aspect of it, right? Oh they yeah, find them I in, mean, like a what, field you know, or something. What 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 could be cooler than acquiring dolphins and and going through the ocean? Well, how about they acquire nothing and just go to a warehouse? Oh yeah, that works. I mean, a dome ship, of course, is going to uh, land in a warehouse or oh they they probably they didn't even have the dome ship. It was all just uh, just axe was hanging out there, right? Uh yeah, it, it was pretty confusing really it was just uh cassie was was hanging out on the lawn in rabbit morph for no reason whatsoever (laughs) and tobias swoops in and almost kills her and the morphing is handled so strangely because sometimes they do like the really terrible cg and then other times it's just like a sound effect toss a little bunny through the air and then they'll (laughs) cut to one of the kids standing up and it's just it looks it looks silly, really. To be fair, to be fair to the TV show, uh, Cassie randomly hanging out as a bunny and Tobias trying to kill her sounds like it, like it could have been pulled straight from the books. Well, that was kind <laughs> of, uh, I believe in the beginning of uh, uh, book four, she was morphing the squirrel to 
find out who was sneaking into her, her barn yeah. and killing animals. And she met Tobias that way. So I see what they were kind of trying to do there is parallel that. Um, it just, it, it was so stupid. It's just not as interesting. I mean, they with, with what they did at the beginning of that episode, they could have done the barn and her having a reason for being there and being morphed. They could have done all that, and it would have been an interesting scene. It would have been well within their budget of what they already did. They just decided to do some simplified, you know, non- making sense version of it well actually she does give a, a a reason why she was hanging out in bunny morph and i like the reason although it doesn't fit her stupid use of it she says um she says oh i was just acquiring and testing uh different morphs because we should be we should be doing that you never know when they're going to come in handy which is a good excuse but um when you're using it to just be a bunny out in the open kind of dumb <laughs> yeah it's not like she was some new battle morph or some new insect that could be useful. It's like, what are you gonna do with a bunny morph? You're gonna that's the yeah, that is an animal <laughs> set up to be killed by another animal. <laughs> that is true. Yes, yeah, bad bad choice. And uh, and they they debuted the skunk morph in that episode instead of um, you know anything cooler than that. It's just it's a train wreck of a show, and we would definitely have a lot to talk about if we were to pursue some sort of uh, extracurricular podcasting if you catch my drift no i would be uh i would be i I say i'd be interested in some kind of uh mystery 3000 riff track thing with the animorphs episodes except then we'd have to watch the animorphs episodes and that's my uh that's my biggest concern i don't know i i would be definitely interested in um taking a look at it because i've never seen it and I already have extraordinarily low expectations, <laughs> and I'm very inclined to just tear it to pieces. And... I do like I do like the fact that um, they took Axe and they took his human morph, which in the book is this. Oh, beautiful he's a famous mix. actor too. I know. In the book, though, is he's this beautiful mix of all the characters, and they they all are all weirded out when they see him, but he's kind of cute and blah blah blah. I like how uh, in the show they're just like, and he's going to have a wacky human morph, and it's going to be weird, and he's just going to be the wacky character. (laughs) Yeah, they they messed Axe up in the show, too. He just comes off as strange. I I don't know. A badly animated puppet? (laughs) That, too, and the fact that any of the Andalites never look like centaurs. Like their their lower half is always conveniently out of frame or in the shadow. <laughs> I think they could have they could have super glued googly eyes onto their stock eyes and there would have been no loss in production value. <laughs> I'm just uh, saying. Yeah, the Andalites look like shit, man. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. What else we got? Uh we have some other else. major news to talk about. Oh, yeah. Uh next week. We are reviewing one of our favorite books in the series, at least mine, one of my favorites, one of the most nostalgic books for me, The Andalite Chronicles. It's a big one, and it's a big one to the community, and I think it'll uh, pop our numbers up. Not that they haven't been already rising more than we expected even now, but um, I can tell that people will, will come out for the Chronicles books in a big way. Yeah, so uh, in fact, it is such a monumentous book. Uh, we have decided to induct uh, our very first ever co-host. And this is, uh, let's call him a guest host. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Well, um, guest guest co-host. There you go. Sorry. Whoa, he's a guest host. All right, calm yourself. <laughs> um, so here, here's the great thing. So Nathan is who we're bringing in. Nathan. Great guy. We're, we're, we're calling him Nate. Okay, sure. <laughs> well, first of all, his name's Nathaniel, but yeah. he goes by Nate. Whatever, I'm calling Nathan the entire episode. Um, so so <laughs> he's a good guy. He's a good guy. Our friend uh, our friend Nate, and uh, he is uh, he's really funny. He's totally, I think he's going to definitely bring something to the podcast. But the really interesting thing about him, uh, to you, listener, why you should care, oh, yeah. is, is that he hasn't read Animorphs. At no, all. he's not read any of the books, and uh, I had debated, you know, what would be the best book to bring him in uh, onto the series, and 
You know, I, I really like the Andalite Chronicles just because it's a prequel and it requires no prior knowledge of the series. It's benefited by knowledge, but yeah, it doesn't require it. Right, yeah. I, I think it still stands up as quite a, uh interesting and action-packed science fiction adventure. Yeah, so we like the idea, even though, I mean, I know a lot of our f- listeners would love each and every one of us to be super fans and to just stroke off every single book that comes in front of us. But we, I, I love the idea. Uh, I love the idea uh, for this podcast, specifically this episode, bringing in someone cold and and giving them one of the, uh, you know, higher praised books of the series and and seeing what they think of it, especially one like this that can stand alone pretty well by itself. I want to give one of our our, our guests a uh, terrible book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't mind bringing in a guest for each uh, Chronicles book, like that being a Chronicles thing. That'd that be would cool. that would be entertaining, or you know, some of the bigger weightier books in the series megamorphs 4 well <laughs> i'm talking specifically about like you know some good marco books or some good jake books i'd love to bring somebody in uh right at the end of the series like right before shit goes down like when in when the when it goes to open warfare like that book that would be interesting to bring somebody in right there when it turns into basically a war movie yeah, um, actually, if if you know the premise of them fighting the secret war wasn't interesting enough, maybe a full on war would be good. Yeah. Anyway, but um, we're gonna try him out, and you know, maybe he's maybe he's gonna really bring some of the podcasts we didn't have before. Maybe he'll stick around if he's interested. Who knows? Uh, but I think that'll be great, and I think for the end of the Chronicles, which unlike Mitch, it's one of Mitch's favorite. I I have. Uh, I have a place in my heart for other Chronicles books a little more than the Andalite Chronicles. How and, dare you? Uh, well, I've I've read it plenty of times. It's been a while since my last reread, but... Yeah, I don't think I reread it until uh, uh, we were in Full Sail together. Yeah, I just don't remember last time reading it being... I mean, I liked it. It was good. I don't remember it really jazzing me up, though. So, we'll see. <laughs> well, we shall prepare see. to get jazzed, sir. <laughs> Prepare to get Jazz, jazzimatized. Jazzed all over the place. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so we're, we're, we're both really excited for that. It's going to definitely be a very different episode of Thought Speak on Animorphs Podcast. Totally. I like that being part of the title. I like that just being there. Thought Speak, an Animorphs Podcast. The Serial. Thought Speak, an Andalite Chronicles Podcast. All right. I guess we could probably get into our review. Yeah? Yeah, Mitch? You want to get into it? Oh, are we going to do the dog thing again? No, so you, you want to get into the discussion of the book, correct? I do, sir. I know I'm human. you were all these things then you just attack me right now so some of you are still human this thing doesn't want to show itself it wants to hide inside an imitation it'll fight if it has to but it's vulnerable out in the open if it takes us over then it has no more enemies nobody left to kill it and then it's one All right, uh, as I think we may have mentioned, we are reviewing book number 13, The Change, this week. And, of course, uh, I'd just like to point out that this book, unlike some of the other ones, um, is, is a, it's kind of spoilerific right there on the, on the cover. I mean, you, you see Tobias here turning into the hawk, or rather the hawk turning into Tobias, with uh with the title of the change and uh especially after you read the back which i'm about to do i just want to point out i would like to just point out that i disagree with you on that uh his, the third book the encounter has the exact same morph on the front and yeah and that's what i was going to say anything. is how lazy are they that they did the exact same cover just with a stupid different pose <laughs> we you know what forget forget interviewing k applegate forget michael grant i think it is 
important to the health of us and this podcast that we eventually interview the marketing team for the Animorphs. Oh, yeah. Get those guys in here. Let's get them on board. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Tobias is standing there in his cool, solid sweatshirt with a purpley, <laughs> cloudy background. Um, and, and the colors the, are uh, nice. The, the colors are nice on this one. I like that. It's kind of a teal and a, and a purple. I, it goes well. Uh, yeah, I love pink clouds. So They're not pink. They're purple. <laughs> I love purple clouds, too. They're magenta. It says, be afraid, Coleman. Because I guess they're just randomly taking any paranoia. The first day, the first day they were hired. Oh, they to, just came up with a list of little. They, they made 28 probably in a row. Like, be afraid. Expect change. Don't know what's coming. My Panic personal the favorite. Streets. This is your brain. This is your brain on yurks. <laughs> this is your brain on animorphs. This is your brain on thought speak. <laughs> Uh, so that's the change. Welcome to the change. I'm going to go ahead and read the back right now. <clears throat> Don't go changing on us. To further my, uh, uh, opinion that this is spoilerific, Tobias has pretty much gotten used to his life. He's a red-tailed hawk with the mind of a kid. It was weird when he first got trapped in Morph, but now it's almost okay. After all, how many kids actually get the chance to fly? Now Tobias is about to make a very special choice. A choice that the other Animorphs and Axe know nothing about. And it could mean the difference between being a hawk and being human. Um, hmm. So that description actually sounds awesome. I like that description. I want to read that book. But that, I don't feel, is this book. Yeah, you think there'd be at least a mention of hork on the back? <laughs> uh, yeah, totally. And honestly, I would have rather seen this book be called The Choice... Instead of the change, it'd be less spoilery. And I feel like, I mean, I'll save a little bit of this for my review, but I, I, I feel like the choice aspect of this was really downplayed throughout the story. Well, I think because they spent an entire other book on the choice. There's an entire book, I'm pretty sure, Tobias is just walking around with Rachel in the mall as a human, just deciding whether he wants to stay human forever or not. Um, so I think we get that later on. I just don't think we get it in this book. Right. <laughs> I guess so. Well, um, that's the back. That's the front. Yeah, um, got all, all bases covered. What about the inside cover? <laughs> let's talk, talk about, about the all. spine. Uh, oh no, let's talk about the inside cover because um, talk about spoilers. The inside cover is the biggest spoiler of all of them. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Awesome, awesome scene though. I like you know actually seeing it. Yeah, I'm glad I didn't look at that because uh, I'd forgotten a lot about this book and uh, yeah, I mean that's uh, how he gets his morph back his human morph uh is a really really cool scene and it's <laughs> it's the second real version of uh time travel we get in the series and so this this book already starts it's out with two layers of spoilers it's like boom spoiler cover oh oh i gotta flip the page quickly and you get the inside page oh more spoiler god forbid you read the book in the you know library or the walden books before you bought it <laughs> yeah exactly Dennis. so uh what are we we're, we're diving in now huh let's dive let's dive all the way i've already divin <laughs> 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 ah okay. so our our friendly tobias book starts us out with um him kind of recapping his life as a bird and sort of introducing his friends um nothing too spectacular uh, this is where he notices that uh, Rachel has been awarded a Packard Foundation Outstanding Student Award thing. I'm not really yeah, sure. Yeah, she, has a, she has a flyer or a, you know, something a that was given to her. Yeah, a letter. And that Tobias uh, he was to read. Yeah, he read it when she was walking out of the school in between. I think she was going to the gym or something because he was spying on all his friends in school. And that yeah, was, I, a good, it was a good a, uh, it was a good structure for the recap. Because he's just going classroom to classroom. Oh, there's Jake. Jake's the responsible one who yeah. leads us. Blah blah blah. <laughs> um, it was done pretty naturally. It's not. It's not bad. Not a bad recap. Yeah. No. Um. I think things like that would would be much better in like a you know TV show format. We got to remember that for our fan fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Uh, Tobias, you know, he he being that he's a bird and can't really go to the the event is kind of bummed out by that and he doesn't really want to bring it up to rachel or he feels awkward about it 
So, so of course, he spends the rest of the book bringing it up as often as possible. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That is very true. Um, he he kind of shrugs it off and asks her to go for, to a. Uh, he asks her to go for a fly later to show her something. He's like, <laughs> "Hey, I got something to show you. Put your wings on. <laughs> Get your game wings on and come with me. Take uh, those outer clothes off. <laughs> Get into your wings." <laughs> he tells her that he's been uh, watching controllers like over the course of his day, cause... like a hawk. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he he's been watching controllers lately to find new ways into the yurt pool. That's what he spends his time doing. And uh, so far, they know of five entrances total. Did they mention if that uh, does that include the ones they've already uh, found, like in the past, like the ones they've used? Yeah, he said the the fifth one is the one they know of. So they he he's found four new entrances. Gotcha. And he mentions that one of them is. Uh, at the uh, car wash, oddly enough. No, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's unless you were watching the car wash and watching the cars go through. <laughs> right, yeah. Hmm. Um, he also, at, at this point, he brings up the award thing uh, to try and, I don't know, make it, play it off as it's all right and cool or whatever, because she apologizes for not inviting Which could have been accomplished by just not mentioning it at all, but sure. Yeah, but then I I don't know. Maybe they would have had to feel like they had to hide it from him or something. Yeah, maybe they'd start uh, down the dangerous road of lying to his face. You, well, or just I think I think it's hinting more so at like this is the beginning of him going to be getting left out of things in the future. You know, like right now it's just this one award ceremony, but eventually it'd be you know high school graduation and uh, yeah, I don't whatever. Whatever mediocre events people have in their lives. He's really looking forward to high school graduation. And, <laughs> and not He's really it. looking forward to going to Chuck E. Cheese, but he can't. You know what? That's not even that's not even a joke. Marco probably would have like his 16th birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese, like just for the joke. I am sure he probably did. He probably went as Chuck E. Cheese. He morphed him. No, they morphed the uh, <laughs> animatronic band on stage. <laughs> Started playing. Uh... <laughs> Uh, so yeah, they 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 make cool on the whole award ceremony thing, um, right off the bat, and they are en route to the car wash when they accidentally kind of end up out over the forest somewhere. I I assume Tobias is just sort of absentmindedly leading her that way. This is just as much Rachel's fault, unless okay, there's two scenarios here, either he found him you know he was obviously daydreaming or thinking about all all the Packard stuff and worrying about it so he wasn't paying attention a ton but either he was directed like his actual flight was directed in another path or this was another jump whereas either way Rachel didn't notice it either I mean just because Tobias is the one flying around all the time doesn't mean Rachel doesn't know her way around town at this point so no I, I I'm saying I think the Elemist literally was just like plucking Tobias from the sky and pushing him the way he wanted him to go. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Then Rachel's, Rachel, you know, she nags him right here, but she's at fault too. She was plucked and put in a new spot too and she didn't notice. Well, so. she she tells him, uh, this doesn't look like the car wash. Where are we going? And Tobias like is like, oh yeah, that's right. And he tries to correct course and he they end up right back there again. So I don't know if it's something magical happening or if it's just... <laughs> <laughs> maybe yeah maybe this is a coincidence and the rest of the stuff is and then the limus sees it happening he's like oh fine okay you guys can save these guys well uh, no th- th- this one's not a coincidence because no, they I end know. up out over the forest and happen to witness like this tree kind of slide over like a i imagine it being just like a plain metal tree that looks totally nothing like a real tree <laughs> it slides over on like a little dolly i'm sure it was more camouflage i imagine it as the lost boys tree from hook so oh. with the sliding compartments and all that nice yep gotta get my hook in um hook reference but anyway so yeah so we see well, we don't see they see uh <laughs> two hork bajir arise out of this tree and instantly in my mind tobias was probably like sweet that's six entrances for today 
<laughs> found another <laughs> found another York pool entrance. Uh, but obviously the Hork Bajir are acting pretty strange, and uh, they're being pursued by a bunch of human controllers. And yeah, yeah. and Rachel and Tobias just kind of sit there and watch it, watch it all <laughs> unfold because they're you know like WTF, mate. Well, yeah, to them a, a bunch of Yorks just came out. It's not a matter of no, and it's not until they realize like with all these controllers chasing after just these two Hork Bajir and trying to kill them. Uh, they're like, okay, maybe we should, maybe we should scope this out a little bit more, see what's happening, because <laughs> it looks like they want them dead. Yeah, and any uh, enemy of the Yerks or anyone the Yerks might want dead is uh, possibly someone worth saving. So they go after them. Uh, of course, and uh, they manage to lead one of them to safety while you know fighting some controllers, um, but one of the Hork Bajir happens to fall into a ditch. And they're separated. Conveniently. The woman, Hork Bajir, I would just like to point out, is the one who falls and ruins everything. Female for Hork Bajir, always the one falling into ditches. Yeah, we, we all know the female Hork Bajir stereotypes. <laughs> they're all <laughs> that true. And the, I heard they can't drive well. Or... Yeah, you, I, I'm not about to go get my own bark. You know, I'm going to have a female Hork Bajir bring that to me. <laughs> Oh, uh, we're sexist to other races. Species at this point. Yeah. So, yes, the uh, what we find out later, the female, Hork Bajir, is left behind, unknownst where she has gone or what has happened to her. But the male, Hork Bajir, we find out later he's male, uh, he, he gets away with Tobias and Rachel, and they manage to stop him long enough and get away from the Yurks long enough that they can have a little chat. <clears throat> Yeah, and uh, it's, you know, revealed that uh, good old Jerahami is, uh, he has, a, the other one's his wife, who is Ket Halpak. Ugh, science fiction names. Ugh, <laughs> well, they're called Hork Bajir, so I we already know. have some of that happening. <laughs> when when are we going to get sick of that phrase, those those words? Well, Hork Bajir is fine. Hork I have Bajir abbreviated it to HB in all my notes because I'm sick of typing that. it. <laughs> well, they, they find a cave for this uh, Hork Bajir to hide out in. Horned Beast. That's That would have been funny. Yeah, they find a cave and uh, they hide the first Hork Bajir, whose name is Jera Hami. Um, <laughs> Hami? I don't know if that's a hard E's or, or what. but uh, I don't know if it's a hard H. Hami? Jera Hami? Hami? I don't know. Who knows? He's got a weird funky foreign name they and, must take uh, it for jeremy so it, it must be like something yeah kind Jera, of like that, i think it's like. jera hummy jera hummy jera hummy oh when you say it with an accent like that it sounds way better well yeah that's, that's the jork the, the jork <laughs> the hork bajir accent <laughs> that's what we should call for the rest of the series the jorks the, <laughs> they're fighting a bunch of jorks the jork habir watch out for those elite jorks uh i was gonna say the hork bajir accent really really makes it yeah anyway jera hummy uh, is me. <laughs> You're not getting throaty enough with it, bud. Jada. Jada <laughs> uh, uh, Better. We could probably voice both of them now. Jada me like Bach. <laughs> you can be the female. <laughs> Cut to uh, later. The group is back at Cassie's barn, as they usually are. Discussing things and events and stuff and talking about their feelings. And oh, by the way, we happen to save a hork bajir today. <laughs> Yeah, well, Tobias is telling everyone about the situation, and everyone, uh, Marco in particular, is not convinced that it's not just a, a yerk trap. Yeah, I mean, it's it's something that looks like a yerk trap, and it wouldn't be that hard to set up, so... <laughs> oh, um, speaking of which, speaking of Marco, as we always do... Uh, this is my first uh, note page, or, or marked page from the book... Um, it's funny that we were getting sexist about the hork Bajir woman just a minute ago because I wanted to read this bit about uh, Marco's little rant where he says, How exactly do you tell a man hork Bajir from a woman hork Bajir? Marco asked. What do you, uh, what do you go out into the parks and pull up all the dinosaur skirts? <laughs> do the women put makeup on their wrist blades? Did they use nail polish on those big nasty toes of theirs? Uh, I mean, that's... oh wait, he, he he goes on, man. I mean, do female Hork Bajir cry at chick movies? Marco went on, talking mostly to himself. Do they get all goo goo when they see a baby? <laughs> I like to think that the rest of the group, like they know, they feel these tangents coming on, 
and they just like they don't interrupt him. He's got to get him out. So they're just kind of like minding themselves for a second. Oh, he's got more. Looking off to the side. Man, this whole thing stinks. It's a trap. It's a setup. Marcus said. But I think the real question is, do female Hark Majir get all weird around bugs and snakes? <laughs> Oh yeah, and then Cassie throws a snake at him. Yeah, and he, exactly. And he cries and he goes, like a little girl. Ah, get it off me. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, good, good it's, antics in the barn. It, there, there are a couple of lighthearted, jokey moments, and um, it does work pretty well. I mean, it's nowhere near as funny as the reaction. Oh yeah, the reaction was another level. But anyway, so, so they're trying to figure out what they're gonna do, and they all decide to head out together and, um, and go check this out as a group. Oh wait, I, was, I have another note, man. What? And then, uh, another uh, reading that I wanted to share with you. But go ahead. I just wanted to read Marco's thing. I remember when Jake used to be fun. Now he's such a grown up. I was never fun, Jake said. <laughs> that is pretty funny. <laughs> I was never fun. He probably, yeah, he said it in a sarcastic manner, though. Of course. Um, of course. Anyway, so even though they're suspicious of this being a trap, they decide that as a group, they should go back to where the uh, hork is hiding in this cave that Tobias found for him and uh, talk it out, see what's going on. Six of them should be able to defend themselves in case some trap is about to be sprung on them. So Yeah, well, and they're, they're also thinking, like, if these are the last two hork that are, are free, then they're the only free ones alive in the, the galaxy and, you know... The, makes it more important which i i call <laughs> i call bullshit on that um why you think there's free ones on their home world i, I would think that it in an alien invasion even if they take over the whole world and they take over everything um there were andalites on the ground the horpager world just just in taking over a whole species there has to be a couple slip-ups i mean, they probably have 99 percent of the hork but it's hard for me to believe it's like it's like hunting the jedi down after the republic fell in uh in star wars the prequels and stuff it's like yeah yeah okay you wipe you quote unquote wiped out the jedi but there's still a couple hidden on dagobah you know <laughs> <laughs> there's a couple hork somewhere on some uh, some distant planet there is a a hork version of superman on on yavin's <laughs> fourth moon there's a couple of you're hanging out climbing trees. Right. Well, to their knowledge and to their credibility, they think that, you know, it's it's wholly possible that these could be the only free hork So they're going to help them. Yeah, that's say. fine. They're, the, ma- the basic conversation is it's an endangered species and we should, you know, maybe try to do something. Yeah. Well, Axe and Tobias go in to, to start talking to them. And as soon as... Uh, one of them sees the the andalite it's like battle mode initiated in fact x almost dies yeah dead dead on that's my contribution good, good comment <laughs> um thank you you're welcome so after almost getting beheaded tobias manages to calm the hork down and br- bring it bring everything down to civil levels and this is when we get the uh, hork formally introducing himself as jeremy uh, jeremy yeah Jera on me. Um, and this is when, you know, Jera and Axe get into a little discussion uh, about his Andalite background. And I think Jera gives him a little bit of, a little bit of guff about, you know, trying to save the hork and failing. Well, I would see it as the hork have the story of the downfall of their planet. Or, or maybe they're constantly being lied to by the Yurks. Or maybe just part of the Yurks, as they mentioned in the book, maybe just having a yerk in your head for that long who hates Andalites, maybe that's rubbing off a little bit. But hork and Andalites definitely have some beef, and uh, they have not worked it out in counseling. I don't know, man. You think the uh, hork feel about the Andalites like Iraqians feel about Americans? Whoa, okay. <laughs> I, don't, I think that's a completely different situation because <laughs> we brought pure... <laughs> Great, great A freedom to those Iraqians. I'm just, um, I'm just saying it, 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 it's a similar situation. No, I, I think it would be similar. Well, sure, I'm sure the uh, a lot of people in Iraq are uh, not feeling we great. We failed to save them. We did. Well, it's a bold statement for the Thought Speak podcast. But um, <laughs> getting political. What are you talking about, man? I saw the banner. It said we won. <laughs> it said mission accomplished. Mission right. accomplished. Yeah, we, we beat them or something. I think it'd be similar to if you're you and your best friend, okay. You're hanging out near a ravine, okay? You trip and fall. You go over the edge. 
the friend grabs you and he holds you. He tries with all his might to save you. He drops you. You break like your spine and you're paralyzed the rest of your life. You know what? He tried. He really did try. But the fact that he failed, there might be some resentment there. I guess. <clears throat> you know, it's his intentions aren't good enough. Well, you're, gonna, you're never going to walk, Mitch. Imagine <laughs> that. Imagine that right now in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. None of that really matters, though, because, because of the this is their only scuffle butt here in this whole book. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. A- afterwards, they're BFFs. BFF FLs. Yeah, they just go into it a little bit. I think they just wanted to uh, delve. I think they wanted, you know, for us, we know what happens. We know somewhat of the history of the hork and Analyze. I think this is the first time in the books, though, that it really makes a play at telling us that, you know, the Andalites did something in the whole hork invasion. So I think that's important new information to yeah, a new reader. Yeah, it up. You know who should have handled the hork invasion? America. Yeah, we, we should have taken freedom to the hork home planet. We would have freed the crap out of them. Uh, Drones flying all over those trees? It would have been great. I imagine a drone just flies over a yurk pool and just starts firing into it. <laughs> yeah, we really wish this series would have taken place later on. We could have drones that would have won the war for us. Shoot bug fighters out of the sky. Well, it's flying funny. into space suddenly. <clears throat> it's it's funny because, uh, you know, Jera's given him kind of crap about that and Axe gets a little defensive and... So Axe is like, well, how do we know that you're not a yerk? And uh, to prove it, Jerah just goes ahead and slices open his own head and shows him his brain. <laughs> Straight through the skull, which I assume for a species that has any kind of antlers or spikes or anything on their head, they have a reinforced skull as well. So he cut through the skin, through some sort of reinforced skull, and just you could see directly into his brain. Yeah. That's pretty hard. And he's like, what up? Check yeah. it. No yerk. No yerk in there. Um, Hork would your one and a light zero. And this is more important than uh, him not be a con- being a controller anymore, in my opinion, is we learn that Hork would your heal super fast, like Wolverine fast, um, which is awesome. That's I. That's one of my favorite things. I mean, I'm going to be going to it a lot. All the biology lessons and, and lessons about Hork would your controller in this book, they really did it for me. I was a big, big fan. Huh, yeah, well, they are lizard-like, so it would make sense that they have what? some sort of healing thing like do you, that. Do you think lizards heal super fast like that? Because they don't. Well, yeah, I mean, right? They don't, no. I mean, just like just like how their, no. their tail heals itself, right? Yeah, it heals in the same way as starfish, where it goes with an arm, but it's not, like, super fast. It doesn't happen instantly. Man, if only there was a book about a starfish. That would be the best book, I think. <laughs> um... But no, no, no. I'm saying that yeah, I don't know where you're coming from with these Nat Geo unconfirmed facts about lizards, but... <laughs> I'm <laughs> joking. Yeah. No, no. I just think... You remember such... jokes? Nope. Not on this podcast. Um, yeah, I just think it's crazy interesting. Hork Bajir, you know, that makes them even more of a threat since they're our main super soldiers. That, you know, they, they heal super fast. Knock one down, you better hope it was a good blow, because otherwise he's back on his feet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we already know that they're, you know, dangerous and that if uh, just a couple of them can take, uh, can overpower the group. I don't know where I'm going with that. You got me all sidetracked with trying to talk about how badass they are. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just saying that uh, it's interesting. And I think the hork so far have been interesting villains in, in the, being the shock troopers of the uh, Yurk invasion. And to learn more about what they are, what they're capable of where they come from i'm up bring it on give me give me bookloads of it i'll take it well you're gonna get it (laughs) oh i am you're gonna get it here and and a little bit later on yeah so anyway continue now we've got controllers kind of spreading out through the forest and starting to pursue them and this is when the uh team after you know getting some peace of mind by by seeing that jerahami is as he claims, he is a free hork Jar Jarhami free. <laughs> they they decide to come up with a plan to help him. And this is where we've got uh, the idea for Rachel to morph him. And in fact, this is, uh, this is one thing that I wanted to point out, is another insane case of Cassie's hypocrisy with her, her inconsistency in caring about species. No, I think she's pretty much... 
the same. She just says we can morph sentient creatures as long as we ask permission first. Uh, she says right here, Jeremy isn't just any animal, Cassie objected. He's sentient. He's self-aware. Axe morphed me once, Jake pointed out, and Cassie, you morphed Rachel. I'm just saying we have to get Jeremy's permission at least, Cassie said. You know what? You want to talk about hypocrisy. I think this is worse than that. Because hypocrisy, hypocrisy would be, yes, if she's morphed, you know, humans and and she said the same thing and, and still did it anyway, even without asking permission or something. But I think it's more of she didn't feel she needed to ask permission for Rachel or Jake for whoever. Uh, because Dude, she, she straight up acquired Rachel without asking permission. I know. That's what I'm saying. I think it's worse than hypocrisy. I think she feels guilty about dolphins and hork because she sees them as less than humans. Like, smart enough to still put her in a bad light if she just morphed them. But humans, it's like, oh, I can morph a human. That's fine. You know, well, they're understanding. They're smart. They'll get it. But a hork I better ask permission so as not to step on their sentience. Oh, no. It's like it's she's looking down on an entire species in one sentence. <laughs> I guess, but I, I just still think it's hypocritical when, you know, she's like, oh, Rachel, I'm going to morph you. Boom. And then <laughs> earlier, the whole, oh, X, why don't you just morph into the guy I like to uh, come over for dinner? Yeah, this is the part where we've got Rachel acquiring a Horkbajir, which is a pretty impressive morph to have on the roster, I think. It's, it's not a bad battle morph. Straight no, up. and I'm surprised that, you know... In the future, it's not more utilized. Although, they, I say that, but I've, I haven't read most of the filler books, so I guess I don't really know. There are quite a few occasions where, I don't think for any mission particular reason, uh, Rachel goes Horkweed's here. She, she uses it a few times. So, yeah, I, I think they I think they see that and do use it. Especially uh, Rachel and Tobias. It's obviously uh, spoilers. Uh, <laughs> when right. when they can both morph, there's a few times they go battle morph Horkbajir together. So oh well, that would be pretty cool. I I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Why the frick isn't Cassie doing it? Oh, because she likes making suggestions on things that other people could do. <laughs> right. Uh. Well, we've. This is where Tobias uh, uh, is worried about her, Rachel, in her new, comfy, cozy little hork morph. So He sits on her head. <laughs> yeah, he hitches right on one of her forehead plates. Yeah. They're running through the forest. I imagine it's like, uh, like uh, 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 the beginning of the animated Robin Hood movie. Rachel and Tobias running through the forest, dodging Drake on beams. Tobias is riding along on Rachel's head peacefully through the forest and the meadows. <laughs> no, it's not peaceful. They're running for their lives from controllers and stuff. And running so fast that he does not see a branch coming, and it knocks him to the ground. It's like a Three Stooges right movie. It really is some slapstick stuff. As Rachel ran off, she was screaming, whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> And uh, anyway, so he, he's knocked off, and he's flaring like a hawk would, you know, getting out, trying to get off the ground. And... Wait, does he, like, actually get knocked out? Like, knocked unconscious? No, no. He gets, like, he just falls to the ground, and he says he winds up in, like, a thorn bush, and so it takes him a little. He has to struggle a bit to get out of it. But before and he And then can... he, he gets up, and he takes off into the sky, and that's yeah. when all of a sudden he's flying somewhere entirely different. It's like yeah, he, he was taking. He was taking out of this. He was taking off out of this bush, and, you know, maybe gotten like six feet, six or seven feet off the ground. And suddenly he's, you know, 50 feet somewhere completely different um, yeah. up in the air. Exactly. So he knows he knows something's obviously wrong. But this yeah. is where he doesn't have much time to think about it because he's in this clearing that he points out belongs to a Swainson's hawk, his, his rival, his hawk rival. Yeah, so it's somewhere he shouldn't be. It's not somewhere that he meant to be or even knew how he got there. But while he is there... Uh, it just so happens, coincidentally, that uh, the other hork arrives. The female wife hork Ket Ketalpak. Ketalpak! <laughs> right, yeah. She's uh, cornered by uh, a whole bunch of human controllers. One of which happens to be Visitor 3, who is hanging out in human morph, I guess. 
And I don't know why it would be in the forest. Well, I guess they're they're still trying to be careful at this point. Kind of, the but woods. I think there are. Well, there might not be hork bajir. They're not hork bajir. Yeah, it's just human controllers still. Right. Yeah, but they're on like <laughs> dirt bikes and humvees, yeah, and they're just having a good weekend. <laughs> yeah, probably it's like a motocross event. Yeah, but before, uh, you know, micromanager. Visitor 3 gets a chance to capture this hork bajir for good. Right. Uh, Tobias figures out that, well, we can't sneak up on Visitor 3. I can distract him enough to distract his stock eyes, which are his main, you know, 360 vision that could catch something. Just long enough that Kehalpak could uh, escape into the woods again. And, and he'll he'll be able to get out of there probably if he doesn't get sliced in half by Visitor. Right, yeah. So he, he manages to trick that Swainson's hawk. He manages to trick his rival into, I don't know, just kind of flying in, I guess. And Visitor 3 is like, Bird, shoot! And shoot everyone the bird! turns their attention to it, and that's when Tobias is like, eh, eh, eh. flies in and... You fools! <laughs> flies in, and this would really hurt. Like, I mean, you know, he could really do some damage and, like, rip him off here, but it doesn't sound like he does. Nope. He just gets it enough that Cat Helpak can, uh, can lumber away <laughs> dinosaur the feet yeah but they get the happy couple back together just in time for their anniversary <laughs> just in time for tomorrow's prom uh the she, find they, each other they, yeah tobias brings her into the cave and she gets in there and the first thing she says is what you get me <laughs> <laughs> where my couffage <laughs> anyway um uh, that hilarity aside um they have another of these anamorph sit down talks um uh, where they just you know just, okay now we've got both of them gotta collect them all what do we do now <laughs> hork budgeer gotta catch them all maybe we can have one episode where we don't sing the pokemon theme song it's never going to happen <laughs> uh but he does suggest tobias specifically he suggests, well, you know, we don't really have a place to take these guys, but I know of a place. It's this Hidden Valley Ranch um, place up in the mountains. Maybe maybe it's hidden. I don't think. I don't think uh, they're going to be found there. Let's take them there. It's a Hidden Valley Ranch place? <laughs> yes, I said. Uh, there's a Hidden Valley up in the mountains, and Tobias suggests that they would most likely be safe. And the biggest red flag i guess that tobias should have mentioned which once again animorphs hiding things from each other um is that he's never seen this place before doesn't know about it shouldn't know about it uh no one should know about it it, it might have not existed two seconds ago but it does now and tobias somehow knows about it right yeah <clears throat> he doesn't think much of that though he's still like <laughs> he yeah still suggests it brings it up I don't know if it's if if it's the LMS that like is making him speak this stuff too. I think they were just uh, out of ideas, and he had one, and he, he spoke it because they they're they need to go. They need to figure out something. Yeah. Well, while uh, while Axe and Tobias are taking the uh, night shift of of guarding the Hork Bajir, uh, they get to have a little conversation here that's kind of humorous. Yeah, um, not just humorous, informative. Uh, I really like this whole part where they're kind of hearing the hork talking to each other in the cave. And Tobias asks Axe, he's like, hey, so we've noticed throughout the series that uh, the hork they they speak a little English. Like, they, they mix in English words to their hork language. And, and Axe drops the knowledge, and finally he paid attention in school, and he explains that uh, the hork language itself, it's like the os- opposite of Eskimos. Like, they don't, they don't have that many words in general. So since they got to work on Earth and they got to talk to people and they got to use complete sentences, um, they mix in English words into their normal language, and that's why they speak so broken up like that. Uh, which I thought was crazy interesting, it made perfect sense, and I'm I'm on board with it. Thank you for more hork culture knowledge. Yeah, it's it's definitely cool, and it uh it also helps that the uh, author didn't have to write an entire hork lexicon. Yeah, wouldn't mind that either. But uh, and you got diehard fans like the uh, people who can speak Klingon walking around. I think I'd be more impressed by somebody speaking Hork-Bajir mixed with English at a con <laughs> or something. 
I, Knock, I, talk. Don't, I don't know if impressed is the word I would use. Uh, it, I, I would be impressed. So learning an entire language that you have to then mix with another language. That's interesting. In Japan, you've got hork speaking half Japanese, half, you know, hork That's That's got to be hard. A it's hard to get the inflections. in Japan. I Not want that yet. <laughs> Eventually, yeah. Oh my gosh, hork in samurai clothes with their spikes hanging out. Oh. That, that would be a good book. <laughs> Interesting. Um, oh, yeah, and just as Tobias is, is trying to tell Axe about these visions that he's been seeing, um, he conveniently gets another vision about uh, some Texans that are coming for him. Or at least he suspects that they're coming for him. They're, you know, tearing through the forest. No, it's, it's not suspects. He says, he tells Axe, I know this is happening. Like, he's he's worried about it, but he's, he's pretty confident in it. So, Texans coming from every direction... Basically, other animorphs are sleeping right now at home, cozy in their beds. Yeah, yeah, that's what they're all doing. Yeah, and Axe and him are out in the moonlight, having a stroll, having a little talk, and they need to get these hork out of here. This is also, uh, though, when Tobias realizes someone is definitely using me, and I'm pretty sure he knows at this point who it is as well. It's not, it's not hard to guess. There's only so many godlike beings they've met before. No, and in fact, I think one of the characters... Uh, hints at it or almost guesses it like right away and uh, they actually had to do one of the cut somebody off to <laughs> change the, the focus of the conversation. Bad form K Applegate. We all saw it coming while we were reading this. Should have been like uh, here in a second when he calls him out on it he should have appeared in a big white plane or something and and he's like a limist I knew you were behind this and he turns around and it's Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got to save the hork Tobias. Will you help me? All right, Buddha, <laughs> I guess. All right, Buddha. What is it, like a, a biplane? Like a... No, sorry, I meant like planes, like like golden fields of wheat. Oh, I imagined <laughs> an airplane, like an old, old-timey old biplane flying was... down, and then the pilot hops out, and it's Buddha for some reason. <laughs> I was picturing the fields from Gladiator when uh, Russell Crowe keeps dying and going to the fields with his family. I was picturing that, but the Buddha's like hanging out there. Okay, well, neither. This of is all staying. This is the best stuff ever. Um, uh, we've got Tobias asks Axe to go get everyone <laughs> because you know shit's really going down. Yo, Axe, let me ask you a question. <laughs> <laughs> Which Axe happily obliges because Tobias is like, I'm gonna take these hork and go for the mountain, but it's nighttime, so it super sucks. Yeah, so they they take off. They you know. Axe goes to do his thing. Tobias is running with the Horkbajir. And he's still thinking about this. This Something's happening. I'm playing into it. I'm being manipulated. And I, I wouldn't think that Tobias would really stand up for himself like this or have this much pride. But uh, Oh, Tobias he, is all about freedom, man. Like, yeah, that's true. He is constantly... As soon as he, he gets an inclining that someone's kind of pushing him in, in a certain direction, he's like, I do not like this. I am going to find out who it is, and I'm going to get to the bottom of this, because they're stepping on my freedom. Surprise, surprise, Tobias doesn't like bullies. Surprise, surprise, Tobias is American and loves freedom. Yeah, that's why he's trying <laughs> to give freedom to these hork through force. <laughs> he's trying to give them the best gift, the gift of freedom. I can't, I can't, I don't know if you can tell, listeners, but uh, July 4th is in like a day and a half, so. <laughs> it's coming out, yeah. It, it'll have probably passed by the time this episode Airs. As Americans, we gotta make sure the change, the only change that this book represents is a change from communism to the freedom of our social democracy that we supposedly live under. All I'm saying is Animorphs gets added to Netflix in July, in time for the 4th of July. That's, that's American. I think that makes a strong argument for the Olympus to, uh, <laughs> existing in real life. Exactly. The Olympus enjoys freedom too. God and exists, why, and he's American. And that's why we're doing this book this week. It's all coming together. Pretty much. So This, this whole episode is an Elemist plot. It really is. In and more uh, ways than one. Praise be to him, <laughs> is all I have to say. <laughs> anyway, so Tobias, while running with these hork Bajir, uh, he gets to talking to him a little bit. He's, he's frustrated. He doesn't know what's going on. Uh, Jera, while he's talking to Tobias, mentions that the day he escaped, a voice in his head said, 
run, Jeremy. Jeremy, run, <laughs> run, Jeremy. And run, Jeremy, run. Jeremy, Jer- remembering his childhood ways and respecting his <laughs> elder He's voice heads. with his leg braces. <laughs> he, uh, he listened to the voice and he got out of there. So, you know, the Olympus has to set up like chess piece, elaborate puzzles to trick these humans. Uh, but for a hork he just jumps up in there and says, hey, man, start running. <laughs> well, that's just the, the, the hork account of what happened. He could have, you know, he could have <clears throat> made both of the guards at that specific exit's uh, Dracon beams malfunction so they couldn't, you know, shoot him yeah, dead. Yeah, I'm right sure away. there was more involved. Or he, he could have done anything to make their escape easier, you know. All we know is that he told them to run. Especially in this book, we get a lot of, uh, well, because we're about to get right into it. Um, this is when Tobias is, is fed up with, you know, the Elemist, who he knows it's the Elemist now. Um, so he stops everybody and, and just demands out loud that he come and explain what he's doing. Yeah, he and... stops the hork while he knows the taxons and everything are coming. Uh, he, he puts it to a stop so that if someone really is trying to save him and save the hork and have him play this part, uh, they're going to have to show themselves. They're going to do something because he's, he's messing up with their plans. Right, and his his way of doing that is by simply shouting... Come out and face me. And then it comes out and faces them. Oh, yeah. Tobias is swept away almost immediately to like this other place. I don't, it, they don't really get very specific with it. The it's fields just... from Gladiator. That's where they are. <laughs> it's just weird. And uh, he also, for some reason, sees himself as like this weird cross between a human and a hawk and like a combination of it. It's like an acid trip. No, yeah, he doesn't see him as a cross between a human and a hawk. He sees himself as both a hawk and a human at the same time. And something else. Multi-planes uh, existing all I know what great. the something else is. We're oh, yeah, I didn't pick up on that. Next book. <laughs> Very nice. I didn't pick up on that, uh, it meaning that. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Very cool. Um, <laughs> Unless it just means, you know, the combination of a human no, and a hawk. No, I think, I think they were deep into writing the Analyte Chronicles when they wrote this book. Yeah, well, it really does set up a lot of um, uh, Tobias's, you know, story. And yeah. especially with the Elemist here, who's telling him, like, you are a pivotal plot point and uh, an entire timeline depends on you. And I have sent Sarah Connor to find you. And you <laughs> An entire marketing team of Scalactus is, uh, at Scalactic is relying on you uh, to sell this book. <laughs> it's a plot point. Um, no, I did want to comment. One of my notes is... Once again, I thought this was done in the last Olympus book, but or I thought it was just a mistake or something, but it pops up here again. Uh, the Olympus says, I am the Olympus, or at least an Olympus. Yeah, and again, I don't know if this is uh, K.A. Applegate still not fully developing the Olympus' character, at least to the extent that we see in the Olympus Chronicles. At least this point, uh, for my own headcanon's sake, I have to chalk it up to it being an inside joke to himself. The fact that he used to be so much more than a single person, or he is so much more than just a single person. That the could be. He is... could just be extremely modest and be like, oh, yeah, I am an Elemist. Well, he does He does mention that he splits himself into you know separate pieces, doesn't he? Yeah, I mean, there's so much more to him than just, I mean, he was that, and then he's becoming a god. And I think maybe, you know, you talk about phil- uh, philosophizing god, I'm sure he's talking about the fact that he can't be the only one, or the fact that he's met other gods, and the fact that a limb is to him, what he is, his name, it's not really a name, it's a it's a being, and the fact that there are other It's not really a name, like it's that. a state of mind. It is, and, and, <laughs> and, to, uh, and to him... He probably does feel like, you know, he's he's someone who's risen from an individual into a god. So why couldn't there be something more, more of him out there? It's it's the universe is big. You I'm know sure what? I just want to say into. worst Elemist ever because he's like, oh, yeah, totally. I'm all about saving the Hark Bajir. Oh, really? You're going to wait until that has to happen on Earth? Yeah. You couldn't have stepped in before? <laughs> no, because, dude, you're thinking way too small. The fall of the hork planet informs the war on Earth. So, you know, that was... It had to happen that way for 
the right pieces to be in the right places during the war on Earth. Yes, yes, yes. A lot and of you know what? Because Maybe the war on Earth, it's happening that way because some other even bigger war that no one's ever gotten to. It's just, it's all lining up. It's just one more section, one more play, one more game that needs to be played out the right way. Right. Well, and he's all about saving Someone. everything, basically. <laughs> he's going to save something. Who knows what? Uh, yeah. Well, and Tobias is, you know, kind of pissed off and demands that he be paid for his efforts to help with the, the hork here. And um, he, he doesn't really come out and say that I want to be made human, but um, I guess that's implied. This is definitely the first uh, experience Tobias has with contract negotiation, and he'll definitely learn a lesson from it in the future. Uh, right, yeah, exactly. Maybe specifically state what you want, because he, they play this, you know, little word game here and the elemist has to get tricky and says that you know he knows what tobias wants but does tobias know him, what he wants himself you can and... make a strong argument for tobias not knowing exactly what he wants or knowing how to put it into words and so he had to be ambiguous and the elemist knows his true heart you know yeah again and you know what i think they really should have again played up the whole choice thing here Maybe by rewriting this scene a little bit and having the Elemist give him no, I like more I of a it's... suggestion about the choice mattering. No, I think that would be too straightforward. I like that, and like I said, we get that later at some point. But I like the idea that it's ambiguous and hard to understand, and it could mean multiple things, and it's up to Tobias's personality and the Elemist's plan to figure out how Tobias is going to be paid for this. I like that. That's It's a more complicated way of writing it than the easy route where you could say, Tobias says this, and the limit says, I'll give you this, maybe. or you know, it, It's better writing, I think, this way. Well, that's just like your opinion, dude. Suck it. <laughs> uh, okay. Tobias and the Animorphs take the Horpagir to the mountains. Yay. No. <laughs> no. Uh, the... the... Elemist kind of deposits Tobias back on the on the ground or whatever, <laughs> back in the forest with the hork bajir, and uh, this is where we actually get Tobias asking them uh, what their blades are for, and we get a solid answer on that. I'm sure this is you... another note of mine. I love the oh, yeah, further discussion of the hork bajir, and they use each of their blades for a different way of carving bark, which is their main food source. This section of the book sponsored by Nat Geo. I love it. I'd. I'd... This is this is what builds a universe for me. Uh, you you're going into hardcore details about the life and culture of the enemy. I'm all for it. Bring more. You know what? I just realized it's been a while since we've had like a really excited uh, discussion about an animal like there was uh, in the message with dolphins. You remember yeah. how, how long the narrator went on about <laughs> gushing about how awesome dolphins are? Oh, it's Cassie, the narrator. Well, so. yeah, I know, but I mean, it, you can just really tell that the dolphins were an interesting animal to go into. And lately, it's been like all bugs and stuff. So I, I guess it's <laughs> they yeah. haven't had a really exciting war for a while, have they? That's true, and they haven't had because of the story and how the story is picking up. Um, they haven't had time to enjoy their morphs or to really uh, go into it. I mean, I mean, there'll be. I know there's books like that coming up where. They actually do research beforehand on what morph they should use, and it gets into that a little bit. But I think this book is completely about giving us more background and being really interested in one of the alien species of this book series. And I, I like that. I like that that's what we're supposed to be interested in. And setting up a new ally for the Animorphs. Ally. Also very important. Toby. What? Who said that? Huh? Well, that's the that's what this is all leading to. Toby. Yeah, kind of. Eh, completely later <laughs> the thing that wins the war whatever anyway. uh yeah this and then it just begins this whole sequence with you know tobias and the hork running through the forest uh looking out for for controllers they're everywhere and it's it's very tense and dangerous and um stuff happens i guess yeah they get away there's helicopters um birds are being shot down left and right tobias is trying to coordinate his friends and tell them you know specifically about what the limit said and what he may have promised and 
Yeah, he tells him that, you know, the, the elements would promise to make him human again. And everyone's quite skeptical about that. Yeah, of, of course. I mean, the Elimist, while they've seen his powers, they also saw that he doesn't use them in the godlike ways they expect. So. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and then, again, you know, they're just in this terrible situation in the forest with all surrounded by all these controllers. And uh, I think at this point they're they're getting kind of sick of flying an animal morph. So they want to get down a little lower to the ground and walk to the valley. Because I think it's also supposed to be really hard to find, maybe by air, yeah, or something. <laughs> they they find some reason to get down on the ground. They they're... they're coming up on their two hour morph limit is one of the reasons. Yeah, yeah, always work. always a convenient reason. <laughs> and yeah. this is when the team kind of debates whether or not they should um, reveal that they are humans to these two hork bajir because if they're captured, that's kind of the end of them. But the hork bajir win them over. Luckily, or the hork bajir basically tell them that we are never going to be controllers again if it even comes close to that and they demonstrate how quick they can be with their blades and everything uh if it comes close to that we will kill ourselves immediately it's not gonna happen yeah he in fact holds uh, one of his blades to his head <laughs> at this point they're just like stop harming yourself we get yeah. it we're fine we trust you <laughs> cuts his leg off <laughs> don't let him get me Jeremy me free <laughs> so uh, after everyone demars into human, uh, this is when the Horde Vajir are kind of, I think they find it a little funny that it's actually been humans this whole time. Yeah, I think they've been witness to Visor 3's antics and raging and, and the fact that the humans are human is hilarious to them. I wanted to ask you if you understood this reference from Marco. It's when they're all hiking to the valley. Yeah. And uh, Ch- Ch- Marco says, should we be singing that Valdery, Valdera, Valdery, Valdera ha, 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 song? Marco asked. I mean, we are a wandering. I thought it was, I, just, I, I, I thought it was reference from. here. We go a wandering, a wandering, da da. Is that, is that it? I, I don't know. That's why I'm bringing it up. Is this some, some elementary school song? That yeah, I don't think you children? would know the name of it. I, I didn't know the name of it, but uh, when he said, here we go wandering. You know, here we go, here we go. It's just a schoolyard song, I think, like a really classic song. Some <laughs> German fable song, I don't know. Um, who knows? But uh, I, I do not directly get the reference, I just guessed. <laughs> well, then you are useless. <laughs> Everybody's hiking towards this mountain valley when Tobias is like, well, this is a good time for me to go off and find breakfast, I guess. It's like the uh, hork aren't able to cut bark or anything because, you know, that kind of gives away their location. It leaves a pretty good trail, and it's already easy enough for them to follow them. Yeah, uh, well, but... and he's actually he's flying up overhead anyway. It's not like he's down with the group or anything. Yeah, but this is what's pretty scary about this is that he doesn't even go that far away. Uh, he just goes a little ways away to find some breakfast, and he yeah, sees, he sees a mouse. Yeah, he sees a mouse, a nice juicy mouse in some other hawk's meadow, probably. But he's gonna take a risk and go grab it real quick. And he's so distracted, he's so focused, he's so hungry and tired uh, that he, as he starts diving for it, a helicopter comes out of nowhere, and he gets completely surprised by it. And <laughs> Those helicopters always taking people by surprise. <laughs> always talking. Always taking hawks with superhuman hearing. Uh, you know, I was out working on my patio just this morning, and I turned around, and there was a helicopter. Blew me away. I mean, like, right there at ground level. <laughs> the down draft, or the down thermals from this <laughs> from this helicopter. Uh, blow... The rotor vacuum? Hello? Yeah. Well, uh, they, they blow Tobias all out of wits, and uh, he launches into the forest, and... Does he break a wing? Oh, he breaks his wing hardcore. Yeah, man. breaks his wing, which is a death sentence for Hawk. And yeah, it basically. sucks because he, he just went out to get breakfast real quick. He didn't do anything crazy, but he's he lives in this world that the other the other animals don't understand where something as small as that can get you killed in the natural world. Damn helicopters. <laughs> I know. Why are they so sneaky? Yeah. Just... I want a t-shirt that has a helicopter on it, but it's wearing like a black ninja suit. Yeah, I want a, I want a bumper sticker that says "Helicopters are my co-pilot." 
<laughs> well, Tobias has just the worst look in the world. Yeah, besides getting snuck up on by a helicopter, breaking his wing, he is then discovered by a hungry raccoon. Which I have a note here in the sense that I, you know, I've grown up with raccoons my whole life. I'm from West Virginia. And I didn't know they were such murderous, cold-hearted bastards. Uh, <laughs> the fact that yeah, they'll, they'll take a animal and they'll just... You know, take it into the river and drown it and eat it alive. We had uh, we had raccoons like every summer, and um, we also had a giant koi pond. And I fondly remember bringing the uh, raccoons down by the koi pond and just watching them fish the koi out and sit there and eat them, <laughs> like <laughs> like nothing even. Sure, your mom wasn't that happy with the death of your koi. Well, fish. no, we we just learned to stop stalking the koi pond. <laughs> <laughs> I like how, yeah, I like how the uh, the watching of the raccoons eating the koi fish was more entertaining than having a koi pond. <laughs> yeah, they 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 do wash their food um, before they they eat it, and which is I just like, that's what he does to Tobias too. I think because he takes him over. Yeah, he's gonna take him and drown him and and eat him alive. Um, <clears throat> but I also like when raccoons like they do things with their little human hands. I know raccoons they run are over awesome, and grab man. cat food and then <laughs> trottle off with it. Uh, and of course, this is when we get the uh, the Elemist coming back to make good on his promise, and uh, he he just kind of is like, "All right, here I'm holding up my part of the bargain." And Which Tobias is like, "Waiting, still, yeah. still getting eaten by a raccoon." Which I think this is interesting. I think uh, as a new book reader, if someone were reading this cold, uh, I feel like if you're old enough and you were, you know, trying to understand what's going on here. It would be weird that the Elimus saves him like this. It would be everything that the Elimus has said about himself, about what he's trying to do, how he does things, how he doesn't get involved, all that. Um, it's weird that Tobias gets in trouble and the Elimus is like, okay, we can do this now. So that should be a hint that something is specific about Tobias. Because I, th- I truly believe the Elimus would let one of the Animorphs, other Animorphs die. Um, you know, Marco probably let him die. Uh, <laughs> but he's, no, he's not he just lets marco get almost killed in every single book practically exactly marco does come closer than most of the others to dying what if uh what if the elements could see that in the future uh of of the normal timeline marco's just a huge dick because nothing bad ever happened to him yeah he's trying to he's trying to or he's setting him up to be as cold-hearted as he needs to be but anyway point is the yeah. Elimus shouldn't be saving Tobias in this manner. He's making a choice to give him his morphine power back, basically. Um, well, completely. And it saves Tobias' life. So that's definitely very specific and very out of sorts, I think, for the Elimus character. Yeah, a little bit. And, you know, it's a good thing that it was just a raccoon and not, say, the <sighs> bobcat that snuck up on him earlier. That we just completely didn't mention? Yeah, we didn't mention it, but... Yep. I thought it was He's... such a small scene. It was like a transitionary scene because he like encounters a bobcat and then like the controllers show up right away and that's kind of ups the ante. Yeah, Tobias is not having a good day. Oh yeah, that's when we saw the Taxons and the Taxon just flat out eats a bobcat <laughs> hilariously. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Just grabs it. Oh. Uh, so yeah, he, he does manage to morph the raccoon and, you know, escape with his life and get out of there. And it's funny because he's like waddling along as a yeah. raccoon. He's like, I gotta go faster. And then he doesn't realize that he could just morph back to Hawk. Well, no, he realizes. I just like the hesitancy in going back to this body he's been trapped in. Even though he loves being a Hawk and he loves flying, um, I like that he gets his power back and he's almost a little frightened to, you know, not use a morph or not use uh, this power that he just acquired. To go back to his regular body is uh, scary. Yeah, I suppose so. And he he points out that not having wings felt really strange to him for a while. And we get lots of good commentary from him. Yeah. Anyway, but the Animorphs basically realize that the Yurks will not give up until the Horfajir are dead and gone. They're not playing around anymore with just human controllers. You've got full roving bands of Horfajir taxons, Visitor 3 himself, all out in the open just trying to find this Horfajir. It is dead important to them. Yeah, and, you know, they really can't fail here because if the Horkbajir are captured, that's it for them. They've, they've, Visitor 3 will for sure figure out who they are. And we have Tobias coming up with a plan 
Uh, and this is also when he happens to drop the fact, boom, Elmus gave me my morphin power back. Yeah, and they're all they're, they're all speechless completely. Um, He's considerably less excited about it than I made him out to be. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, but they still don't, you know, they, they're speechless and they're like, okay, Tobias, great. Uh, it doesn't seem like they completely believe him yet, um, cause he's still in his hawk body, but right. it is interesting, but they, but he comes up with this plan, Tobias comes up with this plan where they're not going to let these Horpajir go. They're not going to let us get away with them. They're not going to let them, we can't let them get back into their hands. So maybe we fake their deaths. Maybe Let's we Let's just kill them. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we just, yeah, slit their throats and be done with it. But no, he, he basically says that him and Rachel can morph Ket and Ja. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Rachel's got the, the male hork and Tobias has the female hork Yeah, Wacky gender switching. A little roll reversal. Whoa. Uh, and yeah, so they're going to they're gonna try this elaborate plan and see how it works out. See if they can trick the Yurks into believing that there's nothing else to deal with. So their plan involves having Rachel and Tobias kind of declare their identities as these sort of and then jump off this ravine with Marco stationed in a unforeseen cave underneath to catch them in time and his gorilla morph, of course. Hoot hoot. <laughs> yeah, I know it's been, it feels like it's been a while since we've seen gorilla morph. Can never get enough gorilla morph. It wasn't in the reaction, was it? No, I don't think so. Wait on. I just said that without actually thinking about the reaction. Well, no, Marco's hardly in the reaction. He's, well, he's just llama in it up. Uh huh? He llamas it up in the reaction. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, That's a battle morph. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. But uh, yeah, they, they fake their deaths. They've got the real Jera and Ket laying at the bottom of the ravine with Jake and Cassie there and Wolf Morph to kind of... Sell it. Yeah, to sell it, really. <laughs> and look like they're eating them. Yeah, they can't just do that. They, they have to sell it in such a way, which Jake and Cassie, from the description in the book, they really sell it. I mean, they're eating pieces off the hork because they can heal so fast. Um, so they really sell it, and they had to do that because if the Yurks looked down there and they just saw two lifeless bodies, they would probably follow down there. And well, or they'd, them. you know, blast a couple of Dracon beams. Yeah, they would there. do something to get rid of the bodies. But seeing that animals are eating it, eh, they're probably okay. It's still pretty careless, the Yurks. Well, I yeah, think. exactly. Let's leave two alien bodies laying around out here. <laughs> yeah, but... Suffice to say, they go through with this plan, and it gets a little wonky towards the end because they end up having to fight uh, a good bit of these Horpajir as Horpajir, Tobias and Rachel, and it comes pretty close. I mean, they're overpowered. They're not as skilled in these morphs yet. Um, all, all of these factors come in where they almost lose uh, until Visitor 3 comes out in the open with reinforcements, and Tobias does something pretty crazy, which I think is great because... His biggest fear, and why the Olympus gave him his powers back instead of just turning him human, has been that he's useless to the team. He wants to help save Earth, and he wants to be part of the team. So he does this bold, outrageous move by charging Visitor 3 and yelling, Jana, hit me free! And, and Rachel follows with, get down, Pac, free! And um, and they, they try to run at Visitor 3 and take him out, and Visitor dodges, because otherwise he would have gotten thrown off the cliff with him. Um, and then Marco does his awesome snatch-and-grab maneuver, and... Uh, they get away with it. Yeah, it's it's a good time. That was a successful mission. <laughs> yeah, for once. Um, <laughs> anyway, but it was no the secret, that's for sure. Right. Well, that, that kind of wraps things up here because all the controllers are convinced that this is the end and they pack it up, pack it in, go home, everyone. Let's all begin. Rejoices over another triumphant victory over the Yerks. And they, they they end by walking the hork to their hidden valley room. Yeah, they walk them in, and uh, Jera and Ket are actually, they've been kind of lukewarm on uh, earth trees and everything up until this point in the book. And once they get to the hidden valley ranch, um, they, they're they pretty happy with it. it. It must be a bunch of redwoods or something. Um, I bet they're pretty thrilled. Basically, yeah, they keep making a lot of uh, Garden of Eden references. It's basically the ending of Rise of the Planet of the Apes, pretty much. <laughs> right. And then um, we finally get one little piece of dialogue here uh, from Marco, where he says, but look, I have to know, how do you tell a male hork from a female? And Jeremy looked puzzled. Male, female, what meaning? 
<laughs> really, all, all, her their only explanation is Jerahami and Ked Halpak different. Jerahami have three here. She pointed at her horn blades. Ket have two. That's the only difference, Marco asked. Other difference, too, Ket Halpak said primly. But only for Hork Bajir to know. <sighs> Cop out. Two things real quick we didn't go over uh, during the main fighting. Actually, maybe I'll save these for the old review. Um, yeah. There's only one more scene in the book after after everyone goes home, which is... Oh, actually, I'm sorry. Two. Two scenes. The first of which is uh, the one Coleman's super jazzed for, the one that is on the undercover flap. Uh, <laughs> this is where Tobias is, you know, back to normal life for him, which as a hawk sucks. He's out in the forest thinking, man, life sucks, and the Elemis sure duped me, when he uh, tries to drift off to sleep and has kind of a strange dream. Yeah, basically, he finds himself in his old bedroom as a hawk, uh, and there's a boy sleeping in his old bed. And, uh, and it's his <laughs> old body. Yeah, using his old body with his own brain. And, uh, <laughs> anyway. Everything's old. <laughs> anyway, uh, he, you know wakes the boy up and he doesn't like flap over or anything but the boy wakes up while he's in there and it's him it's tobias tobias is looking at tobias's old body and it's just it's it's basically uh just a sario rip or the Olympus taking him back in time whatever you want to call it and he allows him to see ask permission on what he does is he tells tobias he tells himself to go to the construction site with jake which is surprising even to himself because uh, he didn't realize until that point that that's what he wants the most. He wants to be an Animorph more than any of the other Animorphs. Um, once he lost that power, he didn't realize what that meant. It wasn't just a loss of his humanity. It was a loss of his usefulness in a war that he cares way more about than he realized. Um, wow, that was a good a good sum, summary. Well, yeah, we, we, Tobias uh, not only tells him to go to the construction site with Jake, but to also, or doesn't tell him anything else. He acquires him. He acquires himself. He does. He, he I'm surprised he didn't ask permission like Cassie would want, but no, dude, he was like, <laughs> my body, give it, give it, give it. Yeah, no, well, it, it's kind of cool. Cause he basically is like telling himself that this is a dream. And obviously he believed that because Tobias doesn't remember this. And I don't care what you want to say about alternate universes, or this is some pocket universe that Tobias went into to get his old self back. <laughs> I truly believe that the night before they went to the construction site, Tobias, the Hawk from a year later was in the bedroom of Tobias, the boy, and he just chalked it up to a weird dream. And so to help him get back to sleep and make him fully believe it's a dream, Tobias acquires him, which puts him in a relaxed state, and he slips off to dreamland. Oh, yeah, that's that's very smart. Yeah. I so, wonder if you could do that, just uh, have somebody acquire you as a nighttime sleep aid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, well, I'm a bit peckish, and I'd like to nip her off now. Can't acquire people multiple times, right? Um, well, you could have a different person do it every time. <laughs> <laughs> that's what the that's what the alternate morphs were really for. Uh, to put everybody to sleep. <laughs> Nighttime sleep aids. The the final scene of this book is just the group hanging out at uh, Rachel's award ceremony for her Packard Outstanding Student Foundation thing. And, of course, Tobias shows up in human morph. He sneaks into the back, and he watches most of the ceremony. That doesn't really matter, but sees Rachel get her award. And it's absolutely, I mean, it's, in my mind, the best written scene in the entire series so far. It's sweet. It's beautiful. He's back there waiting. And you saw it come in the entire book. This is what blew me my, uh, this is what blew me away when I was reading it, is that they handed towards this whole book. You knew something was going to happen like this. I personally knew that Tobias was going to get his powers back. Uh, but you get to this scene, and Rachel comes over, and I love how it's written. It basically says that she's just looking around, and her eyes fall on Tobias. And then she glances away. He's just another face in the crowd. And then something snaps. And she looks back. And she's just blown away. She's amazed. And Tobias is like, hey, Rachel. And then cut to black. Ah, So it's it's great. It's really well written. I love it. It is great. But where did he get his clothes? Stole them like all the animals. I don't know. <laughs> Who cares? Or, or did, he, did he somehow manage to, when he morphed back to his human body, 
Does he just make clothing that was never there appear? Like, does he morph back with boxers? No, no, on? no. He he morphs. He morphs straight up naked. I assume. Now, I think you could make a strong argument for he could morph back to his self into his normal self, uh, and then put on bike shorts and a tight t-shirt and then keep that as his morphing outfit for the future i think that probably happens because you can add to a morph maybe but we need a book explaining did he go back to his aunt or uncle's place probably not no i'd say he <laughs> went and acquired um you know like some fearsome animal and then like robbed a bunch of people um <laughs> i want the book where tobias and x officially move in together out in the forest they move into Axe's scoop. <laughs> I think we get that book. I mean, Axe scoop. No, I mean, like, I want a wacky comedy version of it where it's just that. Maybe we get that. I don't think either of us have read that, so maybe we do get that. Um, okay, so let's let's move into our review. I think we're ready for that. Okay, well, I know that we have differing opinions, and I know that uh, mine is probably the lesser popular, the less popular opinion. Um and it might just be because this is, you know, one of the books that I remember so well from my, my youth. I, I know I've read it in the past at least several times, and I know what to expect from it. I mean, looking right at the cover, you see Tobias. The title is The Change. You read the back. You know what's going to be happening here. And I think once that information is sort of ingrained in your head, it's already kind of letting you down because that's just what you expect from it. And you know that it's coming and you're just waiting for it the whole time. And uh, <clears throat> as I'm reading it, um, it's not one of the books that has me constantly going, oh man, what's going to happen next? Oh, this is so awesome. Because I I knew that several things were going to happen. Obviously, there's the horde plot where the free colony is going to be started. Maybe on my first read through of the series, I, I wasn't as, you know, aware of that and wasn't certain what was going to happen there. But once you finish the book, for sure, um, and you know what's coming, I you really stop caring about them running around in the woods for over 90 percent of the book, because that's a lot of what it is, is just them running away from controllers. Um, nothing wrong with that. It's just it's when it's most of the plot line. It, it gets to be a little dull, I think. I will say the good things to come out of this book, obviously, is that Tobias gets his morphing power back. We've got the free Hork Vajir. Uh, a lot of Rachel and Tobias kind of relationship development, especially with setting things up for the future, since now that's a viable option again. Woohoo! Um, as far as bad things go, I wouldn't really say there's anything necessarily bad about it, um, other than things like Cassie being annoying again. Um, and just a whole lot of running through the forest. It's a really hard one for me to judge. Uh, just because of the important things that it contributes to the series, like Tobias getting his morphin power back. Big thing. Well, judge from your gut. You know, don't don't just give it a score because it has important things in it. No, I, I, I wasn't going to. Um, I gotta go with my, my gut feeling after reading this one, which was that it was just a number th it okay. <laughs> come on <laughs> i'm torn i really am torn don't be torn you know what score you're giving this i know what score you're gonna give this if you you're do. true to yourself yeah. i'm the alimus in this situation i know exactly what your heart is telling you but i have a feeling that you're gonna churn it through mitch's review machine and bump it up a couple of points okay so while I did enjoy the book, I will say that much, it wasn't, this is weird, it wasn't even truly as enjoyable to me as the reaction was. Because the reaction had laughs a minute constantly going on. The plot wasn't even that interesting, but it was just so fun to read. This one felt tedious. It was like, okay, yeah, run through the forest. Come on, let's get this hork colony established. Let's get Tobias's morphing power back. Come on, let's see what the Elmist is doing. It... I didn't feel like I was very satisfied with the payoff of all of it. But um, I'm going to end up giving it three out of five. Three Kalashis. What the hell is a Kalashi? Oh, is that the baby? Oh, we it's... never even talked about them being pregnant. Well, that was such a small thing. No, it was a big thing. It was the future no, of the Orca Kalashi Durace. Kalashi is, is uh, wife. That's wife word. Oh. And um, Kala cat or something. Yeah, was... they, did, they did briefly just 
talk about it a little bit when they got to the. That's the, something we should have mentioned because that's that's the hope for the future of the Horkbajir race, you know. Well, yeah, yeah, they do mention that eventually little Horkbajir will be living yeah. here. I'll leave this in so it's at least covered. Um, right. <laughs> I was complaining about not talking about it. Um, anyway. So yeah, three out of five. I'm sorry. That that's just my general feeling. I think it's it's a good book. Um, I think the way you're talking about it, you could have given it two, but I, I figured you were going to give it a three. No, because three is like that's that's the the standard of approval for an animorphs book. Four is like, oh wow, well, it, it, you know, I'm not gonna go. Your review scale <laughs> starts at three, and you know it. Um, <laughs> um, All right, anyway. let's hear your let's hear you praise the crap out of it. Let's hear you give it your first six. No, no, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, but I am gonna praise the hell out of it. I don't know what you're talking about with your consternation and and your problems with. Uh, the setting and everything and i mean sure we've had a lot of books in the woods but this isn't like the secret where we're doing meaningless boring things in the woods or tedious things this is a uh, escape convicts this is escape from alcatraz this is this is greatness and uh the fact that it's tobias is being the narrator is so helpful uh to just the pacing and and the conflict in this book because it's not just his usual dealing with being a hawk or anything like that even though that's a huge part of this book he's not constantly going on about it he he's a hawk he's accepted it and it's basically his first mission where he's the crux he's he's what everyone has to rely on to get this done because he's at one point him and axe are left completely alone to handle this for the entire night they couldn't reach out to the animals they couldn't get anybody it was just them and that was when it got most dangerous too and so not only that, but he's dealing with Jake-like stuff where he's got gods beckoning him and, and moving his hand around the board, and um, he hasn't had to deal with that yet. And, and specifically, he's been a background character up until this point. He's been the hawk in the sky, which I like that once he gets his morphine power back, uh, Jake actually takes his place uh, as the eyes in the sky, and it works out much better because Jake is the one issuing commands. So it's like Jake becomes the general in you know commander that you've always hoped he'd be uh and tobias takes a, the role that he's always wanted so i just love this book i think it's great from the beginning to the end i think what they're dealing with they set it up well they set up the plot well i like that they're in the woods and it's just this one night that they've got to save the hork bajir or lose this entire race to the yurks again and i think it's exciting i think it's extremely well written it's got a couple funny moments it's you're right it's no reaction um but the mythology it brings, how important this book is to Tobias's character arc, and really to like six or seven other huge books coming up having to do with just Tobias and him having his morphing back and his relationship to the universe. Um, this is the this is the starting point of all that. And I think not only is that incredibly important, but I love, 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 loved learning more about the Hork Horkbajir. Favorite part of this book by by far learning why they do things and I, I knew it already but i love that how it goes into it and how it is trying to teach us about this enemy i mean it's, it's as if they went into the biology of the yurks themselves which they will do later on as well but the hork i don't know maybe maybe they're one of my more favorite races in the in the books even though they're the stormtroopers of this universe uh going into them and and relating to them and having empathy for this character who so far has been a complete controller and a complete bad guy absolutely astoundingly great greatly written um furthermore i think how it wraps up is one of the most beautiful and well-written epilogues of any of the books i mean we've had some dicey endings to some of these books they've not had closure or they've ended weird or awkward or bad jokes or someday will those andalites will come back jake i know marco i can't wait either and then homer runs out into the ocean and that's the end of the book uh you know it, this is so much better than that this is so much more thoughtful and it brings closure to tobias's storyline so far and it's if they animorphs ended on this book it would have been pretty it would have been nice i mean it wouldn't have given closure to everything but it would have been it would have been beautiful um <laughs> no it, the series could not have ended i know the series could have ended but if tobias's main story had ended right here and he just became a normal animorph that would have been fine either uh but I love this book. I thought it was great for what it adds, for how well it's written, for everything. I wasn't expecting to give it this. Not even close. But I'm definitely going to give it 
five out of five Packard Foundation Outstanding Student Awards. Nice. Well, you know, my my score is based on just having all this prior knowledge to the series. I had that. (laughs) I had that as well. I don't see your problem with that because I had all the knowledge that you had from this book as well going into it. I don't know, man. Maybe I just wasn't in in a mood for it. <laughs> no, that's that's definitely true. And I, I like you don't have to feel bad about giving a animal score a good review. Oh no, I certainly you, don't. you still gave I it a good score. I, for, for the record, <laughs> I think anyone reading this for the first time will be like right up there with you at the at the five marking. Because yeah, this this book adds so much to the the continuity and everything. I'm just saying my general enjoyment of rereading this with these plot lines that I already know so well, and I already know all this stuff that's going to happen. You know, it's just the the setting things up again always is something that I, I can't really have the patience to sit through. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I, I feel like I had all of that as well. I just appreciated what it was doing and going to... Like, I knew all about the hork I, I still liked hearing it from this book. It's that well-written. So... Even though I I want you to be clear, this is probably a low five out of five. It's not like the greatest book in the Animorphs saga, uh, but I thought it deserved that extra star. I thought it wasn't a four out of five. I thought it was a for the mythology and what it means to the series and and how well it's written. I thought it was a low five out of five. Well, mine was a high three out of five. It could it could have even been a low four. Every score you give is a high, whatever you give it. <laughs> but. Anyway. So that was that's that's the rea- or the reaction that's the change. <laughs> that's the change. That's the the reactions changed to the reaction of the Andalites. The changed secret of the invasion. So that's the change. And uh and that's our reviews. Awesome. We're done. No, we're not done cuz we got more stuff to read. <laughs> <laughs> I like that turnaround. <laughs> well, uh you want to go ahead and uh I will bang out the trivia right quick. How about that? Sure, yeah, let's get into the trivia. I have one piece of trivia that I didn't read during my review or during the book discussion that I would like to bring up now, though, if I can start things off. I don't know, man. It's always dangerous when I let you start things off. It's scary, especially in this case. (laughs) But go ahead. I would just like to say thank you, Kay Applegate, for reaffirming um, the shipping of Tobias and Jake in this book, where Tobias tells Jake that he loves him. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, I thought it was very sweet, and I like the direction that's going. So, when, good job. When did that happen? <laughs> when Jake saves, when Jake saves Tobias, like Tobias about to get killed by a horpajir, uh when they're fighting, like right before they jump off the ravine, and uh, Jake comes down in his peregrine, peregrine falcon morph, and uh, like tears out the eyes of the horpajir that's about to kill Tobias, and <laughs> Tobias is like, Jake, is is it okay if I tell you I love you? Because I love you, man. <laughs> It's happening. <laughs> this is I believe in everyone's heart. This is their their real ship. <laughs> I sure hope so. Um anyway, on with the the official trivia, the official Seropedia trivia. Um there's lame things like the front cover quote is be afraid and the inside front cover quote is it was only a dream or was it? In fact, did they <laughs> spoil that whole thing right there in the No. Yeah. Kind of. Basically. (laughs) See, that's another thing, is that that's why I was so underwhelmed by this book, because it spoils everything. Just the stupid outsides. That has nothing to do with the actual book. I I know exactly what happens in this book. I I don't even need to read it. No one cares. I can just pick it up and know what it is. That's why it gets a three. I don't care. I'm reaffirmed now. Yeah, well, that's maybe, why it gets a three. Maybe if you could recognize good writing when it's right in front of you, then it'd be. <laughs> um, <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if the outside cover said "Be afraid" and the inside cover said "Don't be afraid"? <laughs> <laughs> no, it'd be great if the uh, outside cover said "You don't have to read this book. Everything you need to know is right here." And then the quote inside quote from Coleman would be, "Don't listen to that douche on the front cover. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great book." So, speaking of the uh, the inside cover, a picture of illustrator David B. Mattingly's cat Orson can be seen on the first page illustration of this book. Standing in for Tobias' own cat, his first ever morph, dude. And yeah, you can see the little picture. Who yeah, I'm frames at a it. picture of their cat and puts it like right there on their <laughs> I don't know on their bookshelf, right underneath their basketball? And 
what looks like their Dungeons and Dragons hand handbook. No, yeah, I bet it is a bunch of like D and D handbooks and stuff at the top. And he has a basketball, not because Tobias likes basketball, but because he probably saw that Jake was super into basketball. And he wants <laughs> to relate to him. Oh, that's sad. Uh, he's he's tried to try out for the team so he could be. No, to he'd Jake. never go that far. But you know, him and Jake, man, that ship is sailing. <laughs> Uh, next one, K.A. Applegate chose a red-tailed hawk as the morph Tobias would become trapped in due to the bird's ubiquity across America. She liked thinking that kids driving with their folks across Kansas or wherever would daydream about seeing Tobias, according that's... to the Anabase Animorphs book database. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and that is true. Every time I know that, you know, being from Minnesota, every time I was driving down the road and saw a hawk fly by, I was like, Tobias, huh? Yeah, so, totally worked. Although, K, I would K, say K, that K. that is more book one trivia <laughs> than anything else. He's trapped in a red-tailed hawk in the first book. Yeah, I know, but the trivia for some reason lists it here. Also, um, yeah, it's it's weird. I, there's been like a red-tailed hawk post on the front page like once a week for the last four weeks, and I I just scroll down the comments and find the what I assume is the r slash animorphs crowd making a comment about Tobias, and then I www.thoughtspeak.com right under it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The last piece of trivia is that this is not the fifth book to feature a cover morph that was not acquired in the book. This is like really weird phrasing here. Yeah, that's As weird. Tobias is in fact morphing from his new hawk body into his old human self, which he acquires and morphs at the end of the change. By this point in the series, the author had been asked several times by fans to make Tobias human again. I didn't know that. That's kind of cool. Yeah, well, I mean, that's... Maybe enough people complained about it. Yeah, I mean, I can understand. I don't... I'd like to not think that that's the reason, because, I mean, her entire motivation for keeping him trapped trapped is to sell the whole two-hour time limit, obviously. And she specifically made his books, and a lot of the people around him, pity him and, and make it a sad thing that Tobias is trapped. But, I mean, if you're an author and you're doing that on purpose... Of course you know people are going to chime in and be like, we want the good ending for this character we like. <laughs> so I don't think that was probably a huge influence on her. I would hope not. Because, I mean, how could you not see that coming? I don't know. Maybe everyone just chalks it up to that. Like, well, of course she was going to. We were asking her to change him back. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd, I'd like to think that it was just part of his character development to at least regain the morphing ability. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, it's at least interesting that he's still a hawk with a human morph and not the other way around. Yeah. Uh, we have emails and Reddit comments as well. We do. That's the end of the trivia? Yeah. That's pretty good trivia, I guess. It's, just, it's few, but quality trivia. Let's go first with the email, because we like our emails. Uh, just just a single email this week. I mean, we also had uh, another submission to our sharing section of the website, which we will post on there not read right now but dylan my boy yep that's what you get for <laughs> sending your collection in for the sharing so keep them coming guys oh uh, we well got... the only downside to that is that they have to go to the website to see it <laughs> well that's fine websites easily accessible um, www.thoughtspeak.com thoughtspeakcast uh, thoughtspeakcast.com what the hell 100 years thoughtspeakcast.com <laughs> <laughs> um and we've got a brand new header photo for that section so check that out as well if you're into 1970s cults I really... Boy, have we got a doozy for you. I made that with you in mind. <laughs> All right, um, what do you want to read first? The emails or the Reddit I'm going to read the email, because I, I feel like the email is more important. <laughs> Not more important, but... <laughs> okay. We, we like emails, so I'm going to read it first. Anyway, so this comes from Kevin Wilkinson. So he says, Just got done with a trip across New Zealand, and I'm so glad I found this podcast before I left! Exclamation point. I always had something interesting to listen to through bus rides and hiking across Mount Doom. So thanks. What do you think about having a wall of shame, fame, or what do you think about having a wall of shame slash fame either on your website or as a segment? Things you could track are number of times Visitor 3 compliments cat morphs, silly Deus Ex Machina endings, like that skunk ending, or books that have nothing to do to do nothing to advance the overall plot. That last one might be interesting to see just how many could be read as separate stories. Anyways, keep the humor, discussion, and ratings flowing. Exclamation point. Kevin W. Huh. Well, I like that. 
he's got a good idea. And am I correct in in, in assuming that he he's listening to us as he's hiking across all yeah, these beautiful places? Yeah, he said he basically places? said yeah, he said that he uh, he just got done with a trip across New Zealand and he found our podcast right before he went. So as he's taking, I guess, the Lord of the Rings trails in New Zealand, <laughs> like the no, they have those tours there that you can go on to see all the locations. From the and movie. this is where Samwise and Frodo enjoyed third breakfast. Yeah, and the guide is giving them all this Lord of the Rings information, and he's got us, you know, babbling on in his ear, talking yeah, about Yeah, no, exactly. Tobias. It's kind of weird to imagine that. I guess my voice has been projected in a country that I have not yet been to. Yeah, I'd say we have quite a few. We have a few international listeners, so uh, that's already happening. We are Very broadcasting around the world. We are being picked up by Andalite satellites as we speak. <laughs> also, I, I do like his idea of the uh, the wall of shame or fame. Um, I think that's something that's that's something we could leave to corroborate with our fans on. Um, you know, people who listen to the show start keeping track of these things. Start making drinking games. We've already seen a couple of them, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, that's something you guys can have fun with and, and share with us, and we'll talk about it on the show. So keep all that information intact, guys, and send it to us. Yeah, I know. We're, we're like 13 books into the series already, and we have not been keeping track of that stuff. I, I mentioned something similar to that, um, I think, back in, like, book one or two, where I said we should start keeping track of uh, how many times Visitor 3 screws up. But honestly, it, I think it's it's it'd be a lot to count. <laughs> 54 books? I'd say 54 times. Yeah. <laughs> Considering everyone survives the end of Multiple the times in some books, too. That's true. He's he's not good at things. <laughs> well, general. that was an awesome email. And uh, yeah, we yeah. are stoked to be playing in New Zealand. Yeah, thanks, Kevin, for bringing us down there. Hopefully you shared us with some New Zealandites and they're getting on board. <laughs> some Kiwis. Do they get animorphs? They get a different kind of animorphs where they're just morphine, you know, like kangaroos and morphs. They only got the one book where, where Cassie went to the outback. <laughs> it was an entirely different series. And them. they didn't even like it because they don't even like Australians down there. <laughs> uh, right? Yeah, they don't. Don't they have a feud with Australians? Like Australians? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Talk shit. Uh, I, get, I get what you mean. Yes. Maybe they didn't know about it. And I just, I just, <laughs> I just surprised them. Now you told them. <laughs> Uh, didn't you all know you didn't like Australians? Yeah, exactly. So, okay, what do we uh, got Reddit comment-wise? Well, we've got a lot and a lot and a lot. We can swap on and off. I'm going to start out with uh, one from our friend Narrative Casualty, where he says, I personally like the intros and bumpers and whatnot. I never watched the show, so hearing the Animorphs talk like that is pretty cool. Chills go down my spine every time Jake says, when I morphed into the tiger, I wasn't afraid for a second. No Yurk was going to stand in my way. But I'm excited to hear what you guys have planned for the new ones. Oh, Coleman, do not we were, disappoint, sir. We were just talking about that. Nar and... Narrative Casualty is watching and yep. more accurately listening. <laughs> <laughs> and I just hope I don't disappoint you with my wacky ideas because they are outside of the Morphing Cube. And uh, I like that he, he points out something that we forgot to mention in the book. He says, you guys missed the best Cassie part of the book. When she's in Rachel Morph and a Yerk yells out, Andalite, to try and get her to react to it, she says, yeah, and a light would be great too. Uh, that's, that's one of the good comic moments as well. Sorry, we were distracted by all the other great comic moments in the book. Yeah, in the last book, uh, the reaction. And I would say that's more than just a comic uh, section. I think that's... Pretty important to Cassie's survival in that book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. He goes on to say, here's some Animorphs-related trivia for your guys' trivia section. We're still in that section, right? Yeah, no, totally. Or somewhere in between. <laughs> Though it might be better to save it for the David saga. Ooh. Um, in the game To the Moon, uh, made in 2011, Animorphs is a plot point. It's mentioned throughout the story as one of a main character's favorite book series. This culminates in needing to answer an Animorphs trivia question to proceed. The question they ask is, what is David's battle morph? After trying as many ways to spell lion as possible, the player gets the correct answer of cobra from a bystander. This is particularly jarring as the other Animorphs listed battle morphs are correct. Because I, I guess, you know, his battle morph is lion. I don't know why the game got it wrong. I don't know. Um, 
Another person nearby says their favorite Animorph is David, which makes me wonder if the game creators actually read the series, as clearly Marco is the best Animorph. <laughs> well, I'll tell you right now, narrative casually, thank you for saying you like the intros and bumpers, which I created. I'm, I'm all for it. But if I'm being truly honest with myself, throughout this entire series, the whole 54 books, plus the Chronicles, plus the Megamorphs, all of that, David is by far my favorite Animorph. Not because he's a good guy, not because I like the things he does, because his saga and his character is the most interesting book, series of books, whatever, in the entire series. It's amazing to me. Yeah, so, you're, you're, you get a hardcore stiffy for it. I really do. Uh, I'd like to point out that um, this video game that he's talking about, To the Moon, um, it's for, for PCs. Um, I, I've heard of it, have not played it because I don't have a PC. Um, I really do want to play it though. It looks awesome. It's like a like a two D. It looks like an old school like Super Nintendo RPG, but it's huh. not an RPG. It's more story based. I've never even heard of it. And uh, actually, I used songs from the soundtrack uh, for my wedding, which you probably didn't even notice. I didn't. Never heard of the crap. game. <laughs> no, I didn't. That's crazy. <laughs> yes, that you would I go used, that far. Uh, I used a couple of the songs from the soundtrack for my my wedding. They must have been pretty subtle because I I definitely didn't hear them. Well, it was just some of the music that played when everyone was standing around. Huh. Interesting. It's got some really it's got a really good soundtrack, I'll say. Fair enough. Um so that's from Narrative Casualty. This next email or this next Reddit comment is from Matra Matria 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 Motria Motria. <laughs> anyway, Motria uh says Hey guys, still catching up on the podcast, enjoying them a lot while doing house chores up to Megamorphs number one. I haven't heard you mention the Opinionated Animorphs Guide on the show at all during the plug section. I have been following it for years, and it's a really good series if you want to hear some literary analysis of Animorphs, though Greg's sense of humor might not be everyone's cup of tea. It's up here on YouTube, and then he links to that. It's in uh, the comments, but you yeah, can search for I that know. pretty easily. I, I, there's. <laughs> it's funny because somebody goes on to mention uh, what's Jack and, Jack and Masiof? Jack, Jack and myself. I, um, I think yeah, I think is, that's a I think that's some kind of innuendo <laughs> joke. This is a joke, um, but this particular Reddit user says they mentioned it at some point, and Mitchell said he didn't care to watch it, and we both replied to that. Yeah, you uh, got on there and you said Mitchell here. That sounds like something I'd say. And then I got on there. And yeah, and you know what's funny is that I forgot that that's what we commented because as you were rereading his comment, I was like, yeah, I just don't care about that. <laughs> yeah, we gave it a shot and we we plugged it once in the show. We talked about it so. Uh, and here, I, I made sure to make sure to read this email or read this comment again so that you can check it out as well. I know it's got a lot of fans, so there must be something to it that we're just too stupid or anything to see or to, to get out no, of. No, no, it's it's like it's, you know, now. this is the, the dude who was the dude before we were the dudes. I mean, we're the dudes now. Yeah, we're the new kids <laughs> on the block. All right. Step off. You hear that? Step off. <laughs> uh, we've got another long one from our uh, friend of the show. Craven Urgeist. You want to read it? <clears throat> oh, boy. It's, it's, it's a doozy. He says, Hey, guys. Always awesome to wake up to another Thoughts Week podcast, and I wholeheartedly agree that books like these that don't take themselves all too seriously and manage to get enough humor into them are some of the most fun to read. I'm especially looking forward to the Oatmeal book. You know the one I'm talking about. I do, but I've never read it. So same I'm, same here. I'm also looking forward to it. Although that was one of the episodes that they made. It yep. was like episode five or six of the tv show yeah it's like book, weird it's like book 15 or something so uh yeah it's it's coming up uh i've pretty much said everything i had to say about this book last time but i'm particularly looking forward to the next book while in general i find marco books most enjoyable to read i definitely find tobias books among the most compelling he's such a tragic character and i particularly love number 33 the illusion also haven't read Another Tobias book in which the bulk of the narrative focuses on him in enduring hours upon hours of physical and mental torture. Sounds fun. Absolutely dizzying to read. Yeah, sounds like a blast. <laughs> Actually, it sounds a lot like uh, a, a retelling of The Capture. Yeah, something like that. You don't have to read the whole rest of his email. He, he goes on to talk about um, one of his favorites being number 26, The Attack. Uh, but book 13 is, is definitely one of his favorite books as well. Oh, wait, so. no, yeah, I, I, I want to read these ones because this is where he talks specifically about book 13. All right, go ahead. 
where he says, um, number number one favorite will always be number 26, The Attack. Still haven't read that. But book... Oh, wait, yeah, I have read it's that. It's the one with the tiger on the front. I yeah, think. yeah, I've read that. Never mind. But book 13 is definitely up there. Totally agree with Coleman that this is without a doubt an essential piece of Animorphs mythology. Hey, I said that too. Not Bush. in so many words. <laughs> <laughs> Not only does it give Tobias some much needed primacy over his world that he had before not only does it confirm the elmist will be a recurring character but it also introduces some of the best side characters in the entire series whose role is absolutely pivotal throughout the series jeremy and ked halpak are so much fun to read both in how help- hopelessly clueless they are about all the really high level concepts of the world and in how s- so naturally attuned they are in some of the most basic aspects of life as they develop we come to see them become a sort of second heart to the animorphs and even provide Home for them when the going gets tough for our heroes. You can really see the events of this book become crucial to the success of the Animorphs later on, and in retrospect, we get a sense of how calculated a move it was for the Elmas to do what he did here. Boom. Okay. And then he goes on to talk about um the secret again, but we've rehashed the secret. Enough. We got it. We got to put a moratorium on uh the secret and the statutes uh, the statute of limitations is about to run out on the secret plus people hate every time we talk about the secret so there's no reason to bring it up uh but (laughs) thank you very much for that craven or geist you are a regular contributor and we appreciate it oh the next comment is again from jack and myself off jack and myself off uh in a later book Cassie starts morphing one animal before she finishes demorphing. So I agree that morphing from one animal to the next could be possible. I like this just a series of comments agreeing with me. I'm, I'm really digging it. Um, <laughs> You're a very for, agreeable guy. As for the two-hour limit, I've always wondered about that, too. But he uses TWO instead of <laughs> TWO. Uh, it starts to get harder at two hours. Yeah, so yeah it does. <laughs> Apparently, it takes coaching from Cassie to demorph at two hours and seven minutes. Tobias has been morphed for several months now. Disregarding what the Elimus is going to do next book, this book, would Tobias be able to demorph if he could summon up the willpower and focus of a god? What about Arbon, who was in morph for like 20 years? Surely at some point it becomes so hard that no stream could even possibly do it. If there was a way to intentionally have a Hereth Iliant, what would be interesting and possibly likely in a hypothetical society where morphine was commonplace is people acquiring babies for the specific purpose of burping them probably by people that wanted kids but didn't give birth or adopt for whatever reason that's a dark dark idea you have there (laughs) shaking myself off (laughs) there's the fan fiction book i want there's the nightmare hell society i don't want to live in um (laughs) to chime in on this whole stairs thing by the way i totally agree with you guys Axe isn't even very steady on two legs it's a miracle he can even take stairs in human morph much less while focusing on a morph Hey, that's true. Yeah. That is well beyond Axe's <laughs> realm of possibility. I agree with you, person who's agreeing with me. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway. The uh, next... Oh, good, are, you, are you done? I was just going to say, uh, good comment good overall. Um, I would say that the whole, as far as the whole willpower and morphing thing, I think it's something that could be overcome just like the instincts of an animal. If we were going to go into the sci-fi concepts and how they've been portrayed so far... Um, Maybe there's no such thing, really, as a nothlet. It's just people giving up. So, who knows? <laughs> I doubt it. I, I, I think it's like being stuck in cement. Like, the morph is cement. And the longer you stand around in that cement, the more stuck you're going to get until eventually you just can't get out of it. That's true. That's a good possibility. But maybe if you can just crack that code, maybe you could get it to a point where you don't have to worry about time limit. Who knows? We'll see. Our next comment is from JJJJJJ Rod. <laughs> and I, I already like him already because he starts out what's up thoughts beat cast i'm <laughs> still us. loving what you guys are doing in this whole series by the way this is jeremy crepo oh facebook dude crepo crepo this is one of my favorite books when i do my read through it really does not have much justification to the plot of the series as a whole and it's kind of just there for the heck of it but the banter in this book is most definitely some of the best in the series oh so he's talking about the reaction yes the change yeah don't come for the plot come for the banter i believe that the animal trainer bart jacobs is supposed to be jack hannah from numerous tonight show appearances that That would make sense yeah although i don't even think jack hannah was like a dick but um (laughs) I think that was just the character in the book. Kind of like the hosts, you know, they were... Yeah, well, the Animorphs books have a tendency to make, like, just any side character who is only there to fill space. 
have well, they them do that. kind of be dicks. <laughs> I think that's actually an important aspect of the series. They they make adults, uh, side character adults, dicks. So well, I yeah, that's and it really adds to the whole uh, kid uh, mentality trust issue thing of just them being able to trust anyone because you they they they're portrayed as like dicks, but. Is that how they are? Or are well, they I, I think also it's a way to write the books for kids. I mean, a lot of times when you're that young and you're reading these books, you can relate to not being able to trust or, or thinking adults are out there to get you or they have these freedoms you don't and things like that. So I get that. Right. Well, he goes on to say this book, at least to me, one of the best in my opinion. Wait a minute. Did I already read that? No. In my opinion, the banter in these books is one of my reasons for coming back to them time after time. It reminds me of the 90s, which I just love. I will have to agree with Mitchell's assessment woot woot, of four out of five. Not a whole lot of addition to the plot, but nonetheless, a great read. Really gives you a good view of the 90s culture. It takes me back. Huh. That's right, J.J. Rod. J.J. Rod. Uh, <laughs> yeah, our it's like a stutter. last J.J. Rod. J.J. Rod. Underscore Rod. And then underscore Sev. Our last comment comes from underscore Sev. And he would like to say in uncapitalized letters. Um, oh, no. <laughs> he has to say, I had a totally forgotten about, say it, brother, good dialogue. He's talking about from the reaction again. And since it isn't really a spoiler, I also like the time in one of the later books when a whole chapter gets derailed with them arguing over 20,000 leagues under the sea. I don't remember that one, but... I don't either. It's we'll, up. we'll see. <laughs> but I can't stand it when I read Ha Ha and also Ha, which is super 90s in a terrible way. And I know exactly what he's talking about. I don't remember. Did somebody say that in probably in one of the later action? books or something? I think I don't think it said it in that one. But but yeah, it's I don't know. It sounds like something one of them would say, like Cassie or Rachel. Would no, say that's totally a Marcus Marcus. Say something stupid. Ha ha, and also ha. Yeah, but huh. that's that's all the comments and emails we have. If we're not it was a bountiful week here on on Thought Speak. We'd like every week to be like that. So that's our show. Uh, and the the next time you come around, we're going to be doing Andalite Chronicles. So super special ex- episode, and we are definitely mega excited for it. Yeah, I think somebody joked that that episode, based on our current progression of reading through these things and discussing them, uh, the guessing and the bets people are taking for the next episode is like a six-hour-long discussion. <laughs> oh, <laughs> which... What, you think the Andalite Chronicles is going to be super, super long? I think it's going to be a little longer. It's a pretty big book. It's well, lot, it'll definitely be at least a, a two hour. I mean, we're at, we're sitting at at least two hours right now with this episode. You know, let us know. But so far, you know, we get thorough with these discussions and we think you like it. Um, we'll see. But I think we'll keep it in check for Andalite Chronicles and we'll hit the major points. So we'll see. Don't forget, special, super, extra, awesome guest host yeah who knows what he's gonna bring to the table i assume it's just gonna be profanity and drunkenness or something i don't know yeah it'll it'll be a civil discussion about sci-fi tropes yeah hopefully that's what we'll get from nate is some hardcore discussion on sci-fi concepts and everything i i want more from this podcast but i don't get from this other guy uh Uh, but anyway so he's gunning for my job he's fired he can have it done hired uh <laughs> <laughs> anyway so thanks for listening you can find more ways to listen to the show by going to thoughtspeakcast.com follow us on twitter at morphcast or like us on facebook send us your thoughts on an upcoming episode by emailing us at thoughtspeakcast at gmail.com and we'll read it on the air as you've seen add to our sharing section add to our sharing section yes send us your book collections uh, pictures of any weird toys you have, anything we can post on the site under our new sharing section, which is awesome. I want awesome. some pictures of that uh, guy's board game, the Animorphs board game. I, I really want to see some close-ups of that. <laughs> yeah, send us those. Uh, finally, guys, you've been so great with iTunes reviews. We've gotten a bunch more, but we need even more. We have not been featured on iTunes so far, which isn't that crazy of a thing to happen for a podcast with our numbers so it's weird i think we just need more reviews we need more people talking about the show uh if you want to throw a star rating really quick takes like two seconds if you want to write a little something that's even better for the show but jump on if you don't have uh itunes like actually installed on your computer because it's super easy to to access the uh the itunes store and the podcast thing all through through itunes but if you don't have an itunes account or anything like that 
just just Google it. Just go into iTunes, the actual website, and find the the, the iTunes listing on there for us. Yeah, and I know every show begs for stars and iTunes reviews, but for this show in particular, this is such a niche show. There really is just a lot of people who don't know there's an Animorphs podcast out there. Not everybody goes to the Reddit site. Not everybody goes to the forums. But some people might be really interested in the show, and they just haven't heard about it. So if we could get featured on iTunes, which is not that hard of a thing to do, our listenership could go from the thousands that we have now to, like, the hundreds of thousands. So um, definitely want to It's a terrifying thought, there. really. It really <laughs> is, but I think that would only improve the podcast and, and get more people talking. So and I, I really want to do to stage this Animorphs re- revolution. I think uh, I can already see around the Internet that talk is more centered around Animorphs than it's been in a while. So... I don't. I'm not saying we're contributing to that, but I, I'd say um, I'd hope that we're a part of the discussion and and helping bring more people to get excited about the series again. So we're bringing it back. Everyone should start using the Twitter hashtag. Bringing it back. Bringing it back. And then hashtag animorphs. And then hashtag <laughs> at morphcast at k a applegate and then at animorphs and at scholastic and trending. We'll we'll make it trend. Bringing it back. <laughs> hashtag bring it back. Ha- hashtag bringing it. Bringing it all back. Yep. So I don't know how hashtags work. I gotta admit. Let's get let's get thought speak cast trending. Let's Twitter. get let's get thought speak cast starting revolutions in third world countries. All right. Well, it's been a fantastic episode. I've enjoyed it. It's uh, it's been good times. So hopefully you come back and join us for our extra special, extra extra special episode next week with a special guest host, uh, Nate, and uh, <laughs> and where we review and discuss the Andalite Chronicles. Thank you for listening. Come back and join us. My name is Coleman. And my name's Mitchell. And I'll see you next time.